a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old time radio. Coca-Cola Bottler presents Claudia. Claudia, based on the original stories by Rose Franken. Brought to you, transcribed, Monday through Friday, by your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. Relax, and while you're listening, refresh yourself. Have a Coke. Now, Claudia. Jingle, jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell. Claudia, there's Mama. Mama, is that you? Oh, Mama. Good morning, and Merry Christmas, children. Hello, Mother. It's about time you got here, Mama. Did I miss anything? Nothing. What's there to miss? Except we missed you. Come on in, Grandma, and take a deep chair. I'm about to baptize the fireplace. (laughs) (laughs) Say, darling, I thought you went to get my pipe. So I did. Here it is, your silly old broken-down pipe. Right in my pocket. (laughs) Say, darling, this isn't my pipe. Isn't it? No, I haven't got a pipe like this. You haven't? It's... This is a new pipe. Really? Why don't you smoke it anyway? Nobody will know. Go on, smoke it. Come over here, darling. What is it? All right. I'll come to you. I'm right here. This is a very handsome pipe. It's a wonderful straight grain. It's it's perfectly shaped. It is? This is a pipe I would have bought for myself. I I hope you don't mind getting a Christmas present. But your old pipe was broken and... and... (laughs) Mind getting a Christmas present of a pipe like this? What do you think I am? Darling, would you mind very much closing your eyes? Both of them. Tight now. Mm. Now, now open your hands. Not your eyes, darling. Your hands. That's right. Merry Christmas. Now open. David, it's a pearl. Mama, look. Oh, Claudia, it's lovely. But it's only one, darling. Only one, David. What would I do with more than one pearl? Oh, it's so beautiful, so glowing and pure on its slender little platinum chain. It's the first of a long string, darling. A pearl to remember. To remember very important moments with. I don't need anything to remember with, David. Oh, David. Darling... This is the most beautiful, the second most beautiful present I ever got. What's the first? You, David. Hmm? What about Mama? What about me? Oh, Mama. Oh, of course, Mama. if you two have gone out and done something silly, I don't want it in. I've told you that a hundred times. He's not a very noticing person, David. Show him to her? Him? He's sitting right over there, behind your left shoulder. Who is? Good heaven. Isn't he handsome, Mama? Oh, he looks to me as if he had indigestion. Oh, poor Solomon. Solomon? Solomon. Lovely name, isn't it? You mean to tell me he's been sitting here all this time? Isn't he very quiet? Very. But he'll talk soon. He's a very rare old duck. I mean, parrot. (laughs) <laughs> Years older than you are, Mother. Well, he must be ancient. He is. David and I thought he'd be nice company for you, now that I'm married and everything. And don't you like him, Mama, just a little bit? I love him. He looks so serious. Don't you wink at me, Solomon. Come on, now, say something. Now for this fire I've been trying to light all morning. There. Ah. There, how's that? I make a good fire, one of my hidden talents. Here, darling, put your head in my knees. Comfortable? It's a good heavy snow. The city will be all white tonight. Christmas night. David. Mm. What are you thinking about? 
I love you. I love you too, darling. That's good. Uh, uh, I love you. I love you. Merry Christmas. 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 They're waiting for a world that's complete in this room. A world that's a crackling fire in the hearth. A turkey simmering in the stove. Sun squinting through the snow. And a jungle bird that knows it's Christmas. Well, I didn't know I was that going was to very make nice, it. Mother. Don't you be embarrassed. David, it would be awful if I left you and Mama for a minute. Where are you going? I'd like to go downstairs and wish Bertha and Fritz and... Lisa and their little grandchild, Merry Christmas. I'll come with you. Mama, you want to come too? No, you children go right ahead. I'll stay up here and watch the fire. All by yourself? What do you mean, all by myself? Solomon and I are going to get acquainted. David. Let's go, darling. <laughs> David, hmm? you don't think we'll be interrupting, do you? No, I, I just so. felt I had to wish them. I know, I know. They're such wonderful people. It's just us. Ah, Mrs. Norton, I was just coming upstairs. Your present is so lovely. Not half of what we'd have liked to have given you, Bertha. We just came down to wish you... Merry me. Christmas, Bertha. You too, Fritz. Merry Christmas to you both. <laughs> and my hands are wet with snow. But come in, please, come in. Thank you. We heard you from way upstairs shoveling away, Fritz. Yeah, snow is beautiful, but not where people can slip on it. How's the baby? Could I see him? He's no longer here. Lisa and the baby... Uh, Lisa's uh, husband, he was supposed to come. That Then he became sick and Lisa had to go to him. Then there in Maryland and... You're here alone. Yeah, yesterday afternoon. Oh, David, isn't that awful? Just think this was to be their first Christmas all together. Uh, couldn't you have gone along, uh, Fritz, you and Bertha? It wasn't possible. Fritz had to be here to take care of the house. Take care of the... Do uh, I look strong enough? <laughs> you are very strong. Claudia, uh, tell the man what a responsible fellow I am. You mean you... Really, Fritz, he is very... I don't know. I do not understand. Uh, you think you could trust me, Fritz? Uh, what is said? Fritz, would you and Bertha do something for me? For anything, yes, that we can then do. Then put on your best hats and your best coats and rush right over to the station and grab the next train for Maryland. <laughs> cannot. Fritz, now you leave everything to me. Tell the eleva- elevator boy, if anything goes wrong, just call me. And I'll be home all day, and then I can... And, and, and when evening comes and the snow's heavy, Mr. Norton and I will shovel it away. You mean that... Oh, I, I cannot accept. No, I cannot... Yes, you can, Fritz. I wish you would. You'd be giving us a great gift. Don't even bother asking him, Claudia. It's all settled, isn't it, Bertha? What do you think, Bertha? I think such a wonderful Christmas I never had. But since Mr. and Mrs. Norton came to live here a year... It has many Christmases. There. How does that look? Wonderful. This side's almost finished. Can't I help? You cannot. Are you warm enough, darling? I toast. You, Mama? I feel marvelous. Never felt so marvelous. Must be the air. It's more than the air. What do you mean? It's Fritz and Bertha being Maryland for their grandchild. It's a funny thing to say. They're in Maryland. We're in New York. I don't see how it could That possibly... child of yours, Mother. But I wouldn't want her any different. When she does something nice, she doesn't even know she's done it. Darling, you're the nicest kind of giver. I am? Oh, you and Mama, you're always talking riddles. I haven't given anyone anything. You won't even let me do the shoveling. Look, Mama, you can see the stars through the falling snow. It's almost a miracle. 
When I was a little girl, I saw each star was an angel. But don't you still? Of course I do. Don't you? Tonight. Good evening, Fritz. Oh, hello. I'm not Fritz, though. Oh, excuse me. I thought that... The shoveling, you know. Perfectly all right. Fritz and Bertha went to visit their grandchild. Oh, that's good news. And you're giving him a hand to keep things going while he's away. It's not doing very much, but... Christmas spirit, huh? If you want to give it a name, I guess that's as good as any. It's a beautiful night. Yes, it is. A night for saying prayers. Listen to the bells. Yes. Listen to the bells. Christmas night is almost over. Oh, I wish it could last forever. Maybe someday it will. Maybe someday soon. Oh, by the way, my name is Norton, and this is my wife and her mother, Mrs. Brown. We're we're in 12C. I'm Josephson. I live upstairs, too, with my father. So there are three of you. On another night, there were three. They searched for the way of peace in a troubled world. And they found that in giving is the true happiness and the true brotherhood of man. I'd be happy if you'd let me help for Fritz. Well, thank you. I'd be glad to have your help. Thank you. For to those who help, there is the richest reward. David, have you ever seen him before? No, as, as a matter of fact, I could hardly see his face in the dark. But his voice. Do you feel as if you've heard it someplace? It's a good voice. I'm sure his face must be, too. Well, I'll be done in a minute. I just want to get the other side of the entry shoveled, and then we'll go upstairs. And dream by the fire. David, mm. you're done now. Mm. Sidewalk is all clean to snow, as far as I can see. And the man is gone. What did he say his name was? Josephson. Joseph's son. It's funny, isn't it? It's almost as if. Yes, darling. It's almost as if. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. The whole world should be singing tonight. Let's sing, darling. Maybe it'll join in. Round yon virgin mother and child, holy infant so tender and mild, sweet. Christmas to you and your family from your Coca-Cola bottler and the cast of Claudia. On this day, which is dedicated to the idea of peace on earth, we hope, as you do, that goodwill prevails among all mankind. Every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you transcribed with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again tomorrow at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir and remember, whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may be, when you think of refreshment, think of Coca-Cola. For ice-cold Coca-Cola makes any pause the pause that refreshes.
The psalmist said, When I awake, I am still with thee. For the child of God, seeking the presence of the Lord is essential as each day begins. To help you in starting this day with God, we offer a brief devotional meditation from morning and evening, a collection from the pen of one of the greatest preachers of all time, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. This morning's text is found in Romans chapter 14 and verse 8. We live unto the Lord. If God had willed it, each of us might have entered heaven at the moment of conversion. It was not absolutely necessary for our preparation for immortality that we should tarry here. It is possible for a man to be taken to heaven and to be found meet to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light, though he has but just believed in Jesus. It is true that our sanctification is a long and continued process, and we shall not be perfected till we lay aside our bodies and enter within the veil. But nevertheless, had the Lord so willed it, He might have changed us from imperfection to perfection, and have taken us to heaven at once. Why, then, are we here? Would God keep His children out of paradise a single moment longer than necessary? Why is the army of the living God still on the battlefield, when one charge might give them the victory? Why are His children still wandering hither and thither through a maze, when a solitary word from His lips would bring them into the center of their hopes in heaven? The answer is, they are here that they may live unto the Lord, and may bring others to know His love. We remain on earth as sowers to scatter good seed, as plowmen to break up the fallow ground, as heralds publishing salvation. We are here as the salt of the earth to be a blessing to the world. We are here to glorify Christ in our daily life. We are here as workers for Him, and as workers together with Him. Let us see that our life answereth its end. Let us live earnest, useful, holy lives to the praise of the glory of His grace. Meanwhile, we long to be with Him, and daily sing, My heart is with Him on His throne, and ill can brook delay. Each moment listening for the voice, rise up and come away. This meditation was taken from Morning and Evening by C. H. Spurgeon. Please listen each morning at this same time for Morning and Evening. Someone to help me. Oh, go ahead. I will. I, you, sir, would you help me with this good for nothing son of mine? Me? What is it you want me to do? You're big and strong. Make him come home with me before he gets into worse trouble. Hit him if you have to. That's what he needs. Someone who can force him to do the right thing. I can't. I could ask him. Oh, ask him. He won't help. He's too wild. He runs around with the worst boys in this town, stealing for the merchants in the marketplace, annoying decent people. It's a lie. You won't say your mother lies. Do you hear? I won't stand for it. After all I've done to try to bring you up properly. I don't know what to do anymore. Please, Mother. Let me talk to the boy. I tell you, talk won't help him. He must be beaten in order to understand. Nobody's ever going to beat me again. Pretty strong, aren't you? What about it? 
Do you think that because you're stronger than your mother, you don't have to obey her? I've obeyed her long enough. You see, he's growing up to be a criminal. A criminal. Someday they'll stone him, send him to the galley. He's got to be punished while there's still time. You can't beat goodness into anyone. Look, son. What do you want? It's being strong and thinking that makes you right. It doesn't always work out. It works for me. Does it? Hit me. What? Go on, hit me. You're strong. You're tough and hard. Hit me. What are you trying to do? I'm just asking you to hit me. Go on. If you really want me to. Is that your hardest blow? Well, I... Yeah. It didn't hurt me. Now, if I were to hit you... Wait, don't please. You see, if strength is what makes right, then the next man who comes along and is stronger than you is right. And you're wrong, just because he said so. Well, I... And since I'm stronger than you are, I could tell you to do anything I want you to. And you'd have to do it. According to your own rule. But I'm not going to tell you to do anything. Because big and strong as I am, I don't believe in that. Since I started to follow the master, I know that strength does not make right. You're one of the master's followers? Yes. My name is Peter. Peter? Say, I've heard of you. And so have I. You follow the master, you must know how wrong my son has been, how sad a life he's led, stealing and fighting. Wouldn't the master himself want this worthless son of mine punished? I don't know. Well, he teaches right, goodness, honesty, all the things that my son is not. He teaches more, too. He teaches us not to judge too quickly, or without understanding all the factors in the things you judge. I can remember, not so long ago, that he told us all a parable. A parable would do you good to hear. Just as he told us. A certain man had a fig tree planted, and he came and sought fruit thereon. Yes, sir, I, I think I can. All my life I've lived on farms. I've worked hard. I've had good experience. I want to warn you, Nathan, that I'm a strict man, a perfectionist. And that once, each harvest season, I demand that all of my gardeners bring me the choicest fruits and grains they raise. If they're not up to my standard, well, I don't have any man on my estate who can't produce the finest. You understand? Yes, Abner, I understand. Well, then, you think you can fill the job... Move into the little cottage on the other side of the vineyard. It's yours. Oh, thank you very much, sir. My wife and I, we haven't been married very long. The cottage will be our first real home together. So, you see, I've got to make good. Well, I hope you do. Now, get along and get settled, and the first thing tomorrow I'll show you around the vineyard and acquaint you with your duty. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Dear? Yes, Nathan. Our prized dish. My grandmother's gift to my mother when she was married. It's the only thing I could save. Not to place it on the shelf of our home. Our first home. Now, you said you weren't going to talk about it. Can I ever forget? When I was a child and I heard these things, I... I thought it was history, something in the past. There can be no war again in our land, I thought. No war. This land is destined to be the battlefield of nations forever. The Egyptians, the Philistines, the Syrians. 
So it is gone, and so it will go. When the invaders come in, you carry what you can, bury the rest, and escape into the hills. And then when you come back where your house used to be, it's nothing but ashes. The last real home I ever had. And I was only nine. Please, dear, don't think about it. We have a home now. We'll keep it forever. You think you can fill the job of gardener? Oh, I know it. Growing things are like a part of me. To see them grow and ripen is the most satisfying thing I know. I'll make good, Ruth. I will. And we'll stay here always. Oh, please, dear, I told you. This is our home. You don't have to worry anymore. Nothing will take this from us. <laughs> with fig trees, you won't have any trouble. Mm, I lost a fine gardener when he died. I'll do my best. Now, look about here very carefully. See? All good fruit-bearing trees. I want them kept that way. Of course. Now then, uh, what's this? Well, this tree at the end of the row? Yes. It doesn't seem to have any fruit. Indeed it doesn't. Take it out. Well, it looks like a healthy tree. But it isn't bearing fruit. Take it out. But it's a tree that's reached maturity. It will bear fruit. What it will do, I don't know. What it's doing now, I do know. It's taking a valuable space on my land. And it's giving me nothing in return. I say, take it out. I think you're being hasty, don't sir. Don't tell me what you think. Just do as I say. But after allowing it to grow for three years, is it right to tear it up by the roots now? At least give it another chance, another season in which to produce. What makes you think it will ever produce? Well, sir, look at the way it's been kept. Probably because it's the last tree in the line. Weeds, the soil so dry that you can tell it hasn't been watered properly. A tree needs care and attention. Water, soil turned up often. It just can't grow anywhere and under any condition. So you think you can teach me how to care for growing things? The whole estate. Did I get it by not knowing what to do? Is that what you're trying to tell me? Oh, I didn't say you that. You implied it? No, sir. You as good as said I was wrong, didn't you? Please, Abner. I only try to say that this tree hasn't had a fair chance to show whether it can bear fruit or not. And I hate to root up any growing thing that's healthy. I, I couldn't be honest with you. I didn't tell you this. I see. You know, Nathan... You're the first gardener I've ever had who wants to run things according to his own personal likes and dislikes. Usually they take my orders. But as long as you insist on being exceptional, we'll make a little bargain. You and I. Bargain, sir? Yes. You say this tree here hasn't borne fruit because it hasn't had a chance. I say this tree is a worthless parasite on my land. We'll find out which one of us is right. You'll give the tree a chance. That's only part of the bargain. Why, what do you mean? You'll have your chance to take care of this tree. If it bears fruit under good care, I'll reward you in some way. But if it turns out that I was right, and this tree is worth it, then you'll have to be looking for a new place. But, sir... Do I make myself clear? Yes, sir. Good. Now get to work. And maybe next time you won't be so quick to correct your superiors. Hmm? Don't you like the meal, dear? Uh-huh. Oh, I didn't say anything, did I? But you're not eating. Uh, I don't feel like it, that's all. You could tell me. Tell you what? Well, if there's something wrong, you could tell me. Wrong? Who said there was anything wrong? Well, then you don't have to become so angry. Oh, yes, there is something wrong. Why I ever thought I could keep it from you, I don't know. You've done something? Abner is displeased. It wasn't wrong. No matter what happens, it wasn't wrong. What do you mean, no matter what happens? 
What could happen? Oh, I had no right to do it. I had no right to jeopardize your security. About myself, I don't care, but I should have thought of you. I should have swallowed my pride. Should have said that I was wrong. Not if you thought you were right. That wouldn't be honest. You don't know what might happen. You may have to leave here, Ruth. Leave here? But you said that... Sure, I said. But I forgot what I said. When Abner told me to take out the fig tree, I, I should have done it instead of telling him it needed water and care. But you didn't. And I'm glad. Glad? Even though it means we may have to move from here, go out on the road again looking for a place to work, a place to live... If you believed you were right not to tear it up, I'm glad you said so. I don't want you to be a slave to what I feel. Don't surrender your right to be a man just to keep a roof over my head. I won't ask that of you ever. But I know what it means to you. If we have to leave, we'll leave. That's all. That's all there is to it. Ruth. Ruth. Please, dear, I know how you feel. Nathan, I'm sorry I began to cry. Couldn't help it. Oh, if there were anything I could do, but there isn't. I offended Abner and he was quick to resent it. It isn't so I had a hand in making the bargain. I had no choice. I know. And as long as it's made, there's only one thing for us to do. We won't leave. And I didn't mean we should run away. I meant that we ought to do our best to save that tree. If what you said is true, that it, it can be saved. You mean you'd help me? And why not? It's our marriage, our home. Why shouldn't we both work for it? Then we will. We could start right now. Now? At night? You said the tree needs water. We'll give it water. Day and night. We'll work for what we both want. And we'll start now. <laughs> Two more skins of water, Ruth. You should rest a while. It's a long walk from the well to the vineyard. And with two heavy bags of water. Don't worry about me. I'm used to hard work. But you, you should have been in bed hours ago. These will be the last two bags. Then let me pour them. You rest. Oh, I, I can do it. I'm strong. You're not nearly as strong as you are determined... Here, now, now let me do it. All right. Fruit must grow. It must. It will. Oh, if only I hadn't said anything. It's too late to look back now. You said it. We'll work hard. The fruit will grow. Ruth. Yes? It wouldn't be fair to make you feel so sure that disappointment might be too great. Disappointment? There are trees that never bear fruit. Barren trees? Yes, I, I've seen some during my time on the farm. No one knows why. They, they seem perfectly healthy, but somehow they, they never bear fruit. Is this one of them? You never know. Time's the only way to find out. Time and proper care. We'll do what we can. I only wanted you to know what might happen. I wouldn't want you to feel betrayed or disappointed in me. The last thing in the world I'd want would be for you to suffer because of me. I know that you love me, Nathan. And because I do, I... I know everything else you're trying to tell me. Whatever it is, we'll face it together. Now, if you're finished, we can go back to the cottage. Back home, you mean? Yes, dear. Back home. Lunch, 
lunch, Nathan. If you don't think it soon, it'll get warm. Just a little while, dear. The earth must be turned over around this tree. And I, I want to finish it before I stop. Has anything changed in the past two weeks? Well, nothing that I can see. Usually it takes more time, doesn't it? Well, you you can't tell. You mean if, if there were going to be fruit, some signs might have appeared already? Oh, I don't know. You, you can't tell about things like this. But it doesn't look too good. Now, please, dear. Stop and have your milk, Nathan. Well, maybe I'd better. Here. You'll work better after you've had a cool drink. Yes, sir. Oh. What is it, Nathan? He's coming this way. Abner? Yes, he, he's coming here on his usual inspection. Maybe you'd better leave. Uh, go that way so that you won't have to pass him. I'll go. Oh, just a moment. I wanted to meet you, my dear. Oh, me? Come here, Ruth. So this is your wife, Nathan? Uh, yes, sir. My wife, Ruth. Fine-looking girl. And from what I've heard, a great help to her husband. You heard? Yes. Uh, in a way, it was funny, too. Two people had been seen prowling around the vineyard at night. I had Ephraim posted one night to watch and see if they might be people who would mean some harm. But I heard it was you and your husband. There's nothing wrong. Oh, no. no two grown people sitting up with a thick fig tree. Well, doesn't that amuse you? Even a little? Huh? <laughs> it's not funny to my husband and me. Oh, please. Now, let's have a look at it. More leaves. Thick as all We've done what we could. Oh, but, uh, let's see. Fruit. I don't see any fruit. It takes time. There should be some time, at least, if a thick tree is going to produce season. It should be showing something by now. Isn't that right, Nathan? You know all about sweet peas. Tell me. Yes, sir, it should be showing signs, and it isn't. I may be wrong, this tree may never bear fruit. But I still wouldn't feel I'd done my job if I'd let you uproot it. Of course, of course. And I only want to remind you that when we have the harvest beef, you and all the other gardeners will have to come and sow your produce. I'll be on the lookout for the fruits and this tree. Need I say more? No, sir. I understand. Good day, Nathan. And good day to you, my dear. As in every harvest beast time, I invite all servants to eat, drink, and celebrate the blessings we draw from the soil. But first, before we celebrate, we shall take an accounting of the results of the season's work. All gardeners are to line up here with samples of their finest produce. Right. And now, first, you, Simeon, samples of the grain from your field. Abner, for 34 years I have been bringing my produce to the head of this family. Your grandfather, your father, and now you. And I can say that never have I shown finer grain than this. Oh, it is. Yes, yes. Yeah, pick up a handful, Abner. Feel its firmness and its weight. Yes, I can see. There. Very good. Very good, Simeon. Yes. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Simeon, there will be a special reward for you later. Thank you, sir. Next. Ah, Jonathan. The olives? Yes, sir. The olives here in this bowl. First look at them, then test them for oil. I have no more to say. You feel sure of your crop? Oh, I only ask you to put them to the test. Examine one. I will. Excellent. So full of oil. When you press one of these olives, it's like tipping a jar. The oil flows too freely. Very fine. Next. Well, next. Ah, oh, Nathan, my big gardener. Step up, Nathan. Show me what you have produced. Well, uh, yes, sir. Uh, here, I'll uncover this tray of figs. Would you taste these, sir? Mm-hmm. Let me see. 
this one. Yeah. Good. Very good. As good as we had last year. Thank you, sir. Oh, but wait. You and I have a special bargain, don't we? There were some special figs in which I was interested. The tree, the very tree which you and your wife have cared for. Have you any figs to show from that? The fruit of that tree, sir, is here, in this other tray. Let me see. I don't believe it. Look, taste. Let me have one of those. Well, they're big. Even bigger than the others. Yes, sir. And the taste... Never mind. I think you're playing a trick on me. <laughs> no, sir, if you'd like to see this. I would indeed. And if this is a trick, you'll be punished accordingly. Come with me. And you too. You can see, Abner. Here it is. And the branches are hung heavy with fruit. Is this a trick? I can't believe it. Amazing. Amazing. We didn't believe it ourselves at first, did we, Ruth? No. When the fruit first began to appear, we thought it wouldn't grow. We thought it would die on the branches. But it didn't. The harder we worked, the larger and firmer the fruit became. Till now, this tree is the finest fruit of all. And I laughed at the two of you. I was going to make you leave my estate for trying to correct me. And all the while, I was wrong. Well... We must make up for that. It's all right, then. We won't have to leave. Leave? A man who can raise such fruit from this tree? Mm. I'm thinking now of giving you more responsibility. More opportunity to use your talent. A man as courageous as you are to risk your future in order to seek truth is a very valuable man indeed. A man to be trusted. Thank you, Abner. It's as I said, sir. The fault wasn't in the tree. It was in the conditions under which the tree was raised. When the conditions were improved, the tree produced fruit. All it needed was a chance. That's what the master would say about your son. A story about a fig tree. What's that to do with my good-for-nothing son? When the master told that parable, he wasn't talking about fig trees. He was talking about people. All people. Not my son. What he needs is punishment. Will you tell me the boy is bad any more than the fig tree was bad? No. Well, then the conditions may be to blame. Isn't that so? He didn't have a father for most of his life. A boy can miss his father in many ways. He can miss a father's guidance and companionship. I know. It was my having to work to keep us alive. Well, I haven't been too good a mother either. You see, a boy needs love and attention and guidance. Just as a tree needs water, good soil, and care. We can't punish the boy any more than we could cut down the tree without giving it a chance under good conditions. You've got a good boy here, woman. He needs another chance. A fair chance to show how good he is. He needs help, not punishment. And I'll help you with it. We should all be quick to help and not so quick to condemn without understanding. As the master himself would say... Judge not, that ye be not judged. Behold, these three years, I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. 
Let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and water it. And if it bears fruit, well. is the voice of truth, the voice of God's inerrant, absolute, eternal, unbroken, verbally inspired word. The voice of truth is coming to you from the Metropolitan Tabernacle of the First Baptist Church of Algiers. We're located at 501 Opelousas Avenue, New Orleans, Louisiana. This is Pastor Albert Pendarmer speaking, inviting you to stay tuned to hear God's message by our late pastor, L.R. Shelton Sr., on the subject, The Way of Holiness, and this is number 180 in this series. We long to be more like our master our Redeemer, our glorious Lord. If there's no such cry in your heart, you are not saved. It's the cry of a child to be like its father. Make me like thee is my daily prayer. More like the Master I would ever be. More of his meekness, more humility more zeal to labor, more courage to be true, more consecration for work he bids me do, more like the master I would live and grow, more of his love to others I would show, more self-denial like his in Galilee, more like the master I long to ever be. Now, that's the prayer of my heart, and I believe the prayer uh, from the heart of every child of uh, of God. When we read in our Bibles, we come across statements like these, Romans 1, 4, listen to God's Word, will you? And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. We see here the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Holiness. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, indwells the heart and life of every born-again individual, and his purpose is to make that individual holy as Christ is holy. Because the Scripture says, Be ye holy, as I am holy. The word holy or holiness means a state of character of being holy. 
It means sanctify. That is to set apart for Christ. It means saintliness or consecration, which means dedicated unto the Lord Jesus. It also means righteousness, which means a conformity of life uh, to the divine law. The Bible is not speaking here of sinless perfection, but he is speaking of the born-again one who is being conformed to the image of Christ. Paul said, I have not laid hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press onward toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So many who claim to be saved can never forget the things which are behind. They're always bringing them up, always reminding others of them. If they ever get hurt by some individual, they never forget it. That shows they're not saved. Listen to Romans 6.22. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, which means sanctification, and the end everlasting life. Why does God chasten or chastise his child? Listen to Hebrews 12.11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceful fruits of righteousness or holiness unto them which are exercised thereby. <coughs> Pardon me. Because the tenth verse says that we might be partakers of his holiness. Trials, testings, tribulations, chastenings are designed to the Lord to produce holiness in the life of his child. Listen again to God's word. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God, which means our consecration to completeness in the fear of God. The consecrated or sanctified believer cannot hide anything. There must be a continued laying bare of his heart and a continuous confession of his sins before the Lord. He cannot hide hatred under a lying tongue, Proverbs 10.18. All of your pretenses and cover-up will go, and the heart laid bare before the Father. And there is a continuous cry in that heart, Make me in the image of my Lord. There is. Now let's read Ephesians 4, 21. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him. Did you get those words? If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now there is putting off and putting on. Paul is telling us here, the new man is the born-again one and has become partaker of the divine nature and life of God and is in no sense the old man made over or improved. The new man is Christ formed 
in the heart and life of the believer. When God justifies a believer in Christ, he does not annihilate the old man or the old nature, but creates a new being, a new man in Christ, and yet but yet one personality. The power of sin is broken. The dominion and principle of sin is no longer in the saddle, for sin shall not have dominion over that believer, because he's not under law, but under grace. Then by the spirit of holiness we reckon the old man dead, and we live the new life in Christ. According to Galatians 5.17, there is a continual warfare between the two. Some old divine has called it a trench warfare. The flesh will not yield. The spirit will not yield. The flesh must be counted dead, for the fleshly mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The new man in Christ by the Holy Spirit continues this warfare against the flesh as we walk in the Spirit and yield to the Spirit by His grace, we are made more and more in the likeness of our blessed Lord. To the end, He may establish your heart unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. These scriptures set forth just practical Christian living, that's all, because according to 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, God hath not called us under uncleanness, but to under holiness, uh, because Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, my friends, most of the quotations I've read from writers quote only part of that great text. They quote, without holiness, no man shall see God. But that uh, isn't the quotation. He says, follow peace with all men and holiness, peace and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Yes, no, yes. No man can see the Lord without peace and holiness. Peace is the fruit of blood redemption in Christ. Peace with God comes to the human heart when the believing sinner has been justified by God in Christ, counted righteous, pardoned from the penalty of sin. And that's the only way he can follow peace with all men in his own heart. There's peace there. There's no struggle there. There's no fight there against flesh and blood. No. No. There isn't. There's peace. Then holiness or sanctification is the outward manifestation of what the Holy Spirit has wrought in the heart of the believer. You see? <clears throat> then the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Now, that's, that's what the Holy Spirit uh, works in the heart of the believer, and that expresses itself in sanctification or in holiness, the new man in Christ, or the new creation in Christ, or the born-again one in Christ, cannot be satisfied apart from being more and more like his Lord. There is that hatred of sin, that abhorrence of sin in his heart. He longs to be free from every lustful desire of the eyes and of the flesh. He longs to be conqueror over the pride of life. But he knows that it is not within his own power to accomplish such. He knows that it is only by him who worketh within him according to his own good will and pleasure. He knows that salvation is of the Lord from start to finish. He learns 
that his power to overcome lies, get it now, listen, he learns, he learns that his power to overcome lies in his utter helplessness and his continual looking by faith unto him who redeemed him with his own precious blood, without peace and holiness, no man will see God. That's right. Now let's look at the foundation there uh, of this state of holiness the believer finds himself in, and why there is a constant cry in his heart to be like his blessed Lord. Now let's notice that foundation. I want you to listen. There is a false foundation known as the deeds of the law, or the energy of the flesh, which produces a self-righteousness which is sensual, devilish, critical, hatred hid under a lying tongue, outwardly an angel of light, underneath a demon of hell, who never sees the faults of themselves, always hunting the moat in the other fellow's eye. The older they grow, the more critical they become. They are selfish. Uh, they shut up. They, they are pouting, many of them, just shut up like a clam and become a pouting and shut everybody out of their lives. Thereby they become cruel in their dealings uh, with others. They always look at the other person in the light of what they are. Now, what you accuse the other fellow of, of you're guilty yourself. Now, that's the tragedy of self-righteousness. They may be very religious, but they've never come to see themselves in the light of God's Word. They have never seen themselves as lost sinners, and pride closes the door of their heart. But the Bible foundation of true holiness and sanctification is blood redemption in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, if you ever listen, you listen. In 1 Peter 1.18, we find these words. Listen to God's word. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. When we say that blood redemption in Christ is the foundation of true holiness, the question we face is, get it now, wherein does the power of that blood lie? The shedding of his blood was the culmination of the sufferings of our Lord. The atoning efficacy of his sufferings was in his shed blood. When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, that is, by the shedding of his blood. There can be no reconciliation of the sinner with God apart from the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, there can be no true holiness apart from the power of the shed blood then we are justified, not only reconciled by the blood, but we are justified by his blood. Being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. In his death, Christ becomes our justifier. He has made unto us justification. Who, who is he that justifies? Yea, Christ died. Christ is risen. Christ is exalted at the right hand of, of God. Christ is our mediator, as our high priest, administering the blood of his own sacrifice. Then we are redeemed, are purchased with his blood. The church which he purchased with his own blood. Then in Ephesians we find in whom we have redemption through his blood. That is, the ransom price was paid in the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, to redeem us from the slave market of the world, never to be sold again under the slavery of sin or the mastery of Satan. Listen again. Uh, the blood 
We have we find in the scriptures that we are cleansed by the blood of the Son of God. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sins. Oh, how a guilty sinner feels that is so unclean when he lies in the dust of repentance at the feet of the Lord Jesus. But how clean he feels when the blood is applied by the Holy Spirit and his sins are put away. How old Naaman must have felt when he came up out of the water the seventh time and found his leprosy was gone and he had the skin of a little child. I'll never forget those the last days before God saved me. How filthy, how unclean I saw and knew myself to be. And I never will forget when he justified me by his blood and applied his blood as it were to the doorpost of my heart, how clean I did feel in his sight. It is so now when I come confessing my sins, knowing that he's just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. What power lies in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is victory over Satan through the shed blood. We find, listen, listen, awakened sinner, listen, listen, despondent saint. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. There is one thing that Satan hates above everything else, and that is the shed blood of the Son of God. He knows that by the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. He knows that by the shedding of blood, that justice was satisfied, and to be, and, and to the believing sinner, that God does not impute sin. He knows that in the shedding of blood, uh, Christ overcame him at the cross because Satan was judged at the cross, ever convicted, awakened sinner, can plead the blood of the Son of God. That's your only hope. Why? Because before the Holy Spirit ever opened your heart to see your ruined condition, he sanctified or set you apart with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He set you apart by the blood. He consecrated you by the blood of the Son of God. That's the basis on which you can plead for mercy for your poor, wretched, miserable, ruined, lost, guilty soul. Oh, blessed saint, that's the only basis on which you and I can approach the God of heaven. Listen to God's word. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has consecrated, that is open for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Therefore, therefore, we can draw nigh through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we can come boldly to, to the throne of grace through his shed blood. Come with encouragement. Come with confidence. Come with assurance. Come freely. Come with all of our sins. Come with our pleas and our petitions based on one thing only, the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you beginning to see the power of the shed blood of the Son of God, our substitute, our Redeemer? Then there's life through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your soul. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. That's what Paul made in Acts 20, 28. He hath purchased the church with his own blood. The life is in the blood. As the soul or life is in the blood, the value of blood corresponds to the value of the life that is in it. Now get this statement. There is no mind that can fathom, no words that can express or tell the value or the power of the blood of Jesus as in that, as in that blood dwelt the soul 
of the Holy Son of God and the eternal life of the Godhead was carried in that blood. That's a mystery you cannot explain, but it, it's an eternal fact that you can experience in your heart when the shed blood of the Lord Jesus is applied by the Holy Spirit and thereby gives you eternal life in Christ that changes your whole inner being, your whole thinking, your whole attitude, and you become a new creature in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therein lies the foundation of true holiness and true sanctification. The power of the blood of Jesus is nothing less than the eternal power of God himself, the power of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus lies above everything else in the fact that it is offered to God on the altar for redemption. What a price the Lord God of heaven paid for poor, wretched sinners like us. Then that brings us to this thought. It is through the power of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that we are brought in union with God himself and are made one with Christ and become bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. There is that mystic union between Christ and the believer that is wrought uh, there through the shed blood of the Son of God in Christ Jesus. And the believer becomes one, inseparable, Christ in the believer, and the believer in Christ, Christ and the believer in God. Then our life is the life of the Son of God. So it is then God who worketh in us to will and to do of his own good pleasure. This implanted nature, which is a new creation in Christ Jesus, manifests itself in true holiness and righteousness in the believer's life. It is not a self-righteousness. It is not a righteousness or holiness that is produced by the individual himself, but that which is produced by the grace of God. Then the believer gives God all the glory. This new creation is easily entreated, peaceable, gentle, full of mercy, good fruits, and is without hypocrisy, and the fruit of which is righteousness, sown in peace, love springing from such a heart, covereth the multitude of sins, suffereth long, and is kind, does not envy, nor bone itself, neither is puffed up. Such love is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. This kind of love does not try to dominate, but believeth all things, beareth all things, and hopeth all things, and endureth all things, and beareth all things. Such is the power of the blood of Christ as the foundation of true holiness and righteousness. I wish we had time to go just a little further and show you uh, the true uh, solid foundation on which true holiness is built. And we continue to find it in the power of the blood. When blood is shed, we think of death. Death always follows when the blood or soul is poured out. Death makes us think of sin. God gave the blood on the altar as an atonement for sin. This means that the sins of the transgressor were laid on the victim, and its death was reckoned as the death or punishment for the sins laid upon it. When thou shalt make a soul an offering for sin, says the Word. This is a great moment in the believer's life when he comes to see by faith that all of his sins were laid on Christ, and his death on the cross was the sinner's death. Yeah. Praise God for substitution. Praise God for the power of the shed blood of the Son of God that produces true holiness and true righteousness. This brings to the close another broadcast. We want to thank you for your letters and gifts that keep these messages going out over the Voice of Truth program each week. Again, the title of the message was The Way of Holiness, and this is number 180, number 180 in this series. 
You may have a free printed copy simply by requesting it. Also, it's available on cassette tape for three dollars each. The cassette tape includes a complete hour with the radio choir singing, the letter reading, and the complete hour of the tape. It's also available on printed page simply the booklet form simply by writing us. Also, I'd like to remember, remind you of our Paul Fellowship Day, the last Sunday in October. It's not very far off, is it? And uh, we'll be looking for many of you folks. Also, I want to say how much we appreciate you folks to uh, supporting this work. And that, I'm asking you to continue to pray with us and pray for us. Pray for me, would you? I need your prayers. I face the world day by day. I face the fiery darts of Satan here day by day. And, and I need your prayers. Would you pray for me? Would you write me and tell me you're praying for me? And sit down and write me a letter. Just sit down and write me a letter and say, Pastor, I'm praying for you. If you will, also include the call letters of the station to which you're listening. Tell me if you're hearing the broadcast over the Internet now that we mentioned shortly ago. Let me give you our mailing address. It's Radio Missions, Post Office Box 6250, New Orleans, Louisiana, 70174. That's Post Office Box 6250, New Orleans, Louisiana, 70174. I appreciate you tuning in at this time. Would you sit down and write me? Send me a generous offering for the Voice of Truth broadcast. And uh, we, we appreciate it. Yes, we always appreciate hearing from you. May the Lord's richest blessings rest upon you. This is the Voice of Truth broadcast. I want to bring to you a message this morning upon a great verse which I have called the golden key to life's mysteries. It's found in verse 7 of the 13th chapter of John. What I do says the Lord Jesus Christ to Peter, Thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. What I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. The Lord Jesus Christ has come to the conclusion of his earthly ministry. Athwart his path is the dark shadow of Calvary. He's going out to the sweat of blood and Gethsemane to be despised and rejected and smitten and spit upon in Pilate's judgment hall. He's going to climb the old hell cry called Golgotha and hang for sinners upon the accursed tree. And before he goes, he gives to Peter a key that will solve all life's mysteries. He says, Peter... What I do, you don't understand. You cannot comprehend. You cannot explain or define what I'm doing now. But Peter, what I'm doing in the present, someday you'll understand. And when the great future unfolds to us the maze, of all life's mysteries, then, Peter, you'll know that and you'll understand it all in the sweet by and by. There are two things in this verse. First of all, there is underlined and underscored our present ignorance assertion. 
He's asserting to Peter his ignorance now in the present. This goes against the grain for the clever people of the 20th century who think they know everything. But the Lord's saying to us, you don't know everything. You don't understand it the least little bit. He asserts our present ignorance. But he does something more. In this verse, we have underscored and underlined our future knowledge assured. And in this verse, there's not merely the assertion that we don't know what he's doing now, and we cannot understand it. But there is the glorious assurance that someday I'll understand it all perfectly. It's no wonder, my friend, that the saints take up the golden hearts. It's no wonder that the great anthem chorus swells until the vaults of heaven re-echo with the praises of Jesus. Why? Because the saints in heaven, they understand. They have seen the end from the beginning. And today they're blessing the hand that guided. And they're blessing the heart that planned. For their throne where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. I want to look for a moment at this, our present ignorance that is asserted. Life is a great mystery. And before us there's a great fog that keeps the future. And it is only as we pierce that fog hour by hour and day by day and week by week that we find out what's before us. It's a good thing we didn't know in December last year what was going to happen this year, isn't it? It's a good thing that we didn't know the dark valleys or the storms or the tempests or the disappointments or the sicknesses or the sufferings that we were going to have to face. Life is one great mystery. But you know, my friend, it's a pilgrimage. And each day as we go on, the path winds and twists. Sometimes we're going downhill. Sometimes we're going uphill. Sometimes we're in a valley. Someday we're on the mountain top. And you know, it's hour by hour and minute by minute that life's rugged road unveils itself. And the Lord saying as we go round the corner and we don't know what's on the other side of the corner, He says, what I'm doing, you don't know now. I'm sure, my friend, you remember Job. It's a great book, Job. You should always read the book of Job when you're in trouble. Because Job was in great trouble. Terrible trouble. And you know, there were men came to comfort them. We still have the proverb, Job's comforters. And you know, for seven days there were wise men. They never said anything. They kept their mouths closed. And then when they opened their mouths, what fools they made of themselves. You know what they tried to do? They tried to explain to Job how it all happened and they didn't understand it. I used to think when I was a young minister I could explain things to people. But I discovered that it was utter folly. There's no explanation now, friend. I don't understand why that poor sin of God has a body riddled with cancer. And she's down there in life's terrible fever and disease and sickness. I don't understand it. But one day we'll understand. I don't know why the good people of this world are trodden down and why wicked people... Spread themselves like a great bay tree. I don't understand them, but praise God, someday I'll understand. I don't know why one kingdom is prosperous and another kingdom is in adversity. I don't understand why one home seems never to have a blast of sorrow and another home is blasted and blighted with sorrow day after day and hour after hour. But praise God, Someday we'll understand it all. The Lord's asserting our ignorance. Don't go speculating, friend. 
Don't go try to explain it. Just leave it in the Master's hand. He's working it all out. He's got his hand upon the helm. Life is a voyage. And my friend, every voyage has its storm. And we have been through, some of us have been through the storms. And we have the marks of the battering upon us. But you know, we didn't sail under our own steam. Ours was a little boat and the stormy sea was terrible. But Jesus was aboard the vessel. We used to sing in Sabbath school with Christ in the vessel. I'll smile at the storm as I go sailing home. And friend, Jesus Christ is aboard the vessel. And we cannot understand. Do you remember the disciples? Jesus went to sleep and the storm came on the sea. And poor Peter and John are in a terrible way. And they're feeling the water over the side. And John says, Peter, it's no good. We're going to sink. We're all going to be lost. And they look at Jesus and he's sleeping. Unconcerned. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ had that intimate knowledge that he was in his Father's hand. There's no need to be alarmed. And then when they woke him, what did he say? He said, you don't need to be alarmed. But for your sakes, not for my own sakes, I'll still the waves. And he stood up in that boat. Have you ever imagined that scene in this great stormy waves lashing against the sides of the boat and the boat almost filled with water and the roar of the thunderous stormy winds? Jesus stands up there in perfect calm. And he says, lie down, be calm, be at peace. And the Bible says suddenly there was a great calm. I have sailed in life's seas, and I've been in the boat when it has been filled with water. And I've heard the thunder of the storm, and I have been scared out of my wits at what was going to happen. And then Jesus stood up, and he said, you don't need to be afraid. And suddenly, there was a great calm. Isn't that what he did for us when we were in the stormy sea of sin? And when our hearts were broken with the thunders of our own iniquities, Jesus came and he said, Be still. And we got the stillness of his forgiveness and the peace of his everlasting pardon. You don't know, he says, what I'm doing, but you'll know hereafter. You know, we have not only the assertion of our ignorance here, but we have our future knowledge assured. But I was in the prison. I was in the garden. I had a garden party every day. And uh, we were sowing seeds. And you know those little seeds? We took them. And we put them into the soil that was prepared. It had to be carefully prepared. I knew nothing about gardening before I went to prison. I know a little now, just a little. So if you want your garden done for the building fund, I'll do it for you. <laughs> Amen. And uh, I took that little seed, and the soil was prepared, and I buried it. And I could have said to that little seed, you don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to shut you out from the sunlight. I'm going to shut you out from the day. I'm going to bury you deep in the soil. And then I took the watering can and the specially prepared mixture, and I poured it over that seed. And that seed was buried in the damp, dark, dismal soil. Didn't know what was happening. And then we put the glass over it. And we left it there in the propagating house, and with the heat and the sunshine, in a few days' time we saw the little shoots coming up. It didn't know what was happening to it. It was dark and dismal in the prepared soil, and it was baptized with the water. But the sun brought up the shoot, and it wasn't very long until we saw the little flower beginning to grow. 
And my friend, God has buried us, some of us, in prepared soil. And at times it has been dark and it has been dismal. And at times we wondered why. But then God sends the sunlight. And there comes a day when he says, you didn't know what I was doing. But you're beginning to learn a little that I had my hand in the situation. Mother, you didn't know what God was doing when he took the little one away from you. And your heart was broken, but praise God, you'll know hereafter. You didn't understand, brother, when God took the partner of your life away from your side. But someday, bless God, you'll understand. I didn't know why God would put me in a prison cell and shut me away from my friends and my work and my preaching and my evangelism and my stand for God. But praise God, we'll understand it all. And we're learning a little, aren't we? And we can see through the maze of life's mysteries something of the mighty overworking power, overwhelming power of our sovereign God. You remember, Joseph, you know, I have been looking at some of the jailbirds of Scripture to get a little bit of encouragement. And poor old Joseph, you know, he was blessed in his birth. And his father made him a young man of worth in his home, and he put a beautiful robe on him. And how happy young Joseph was doing the father's business in the coat of many colors. But then one day, the cruel hands of his brothers tore that coat off. And his joy was turned to shame. And his rejoicing was turned to sorrow. And they put him down into the pit. Joseph didn't know what they were doing. And they brought him up. And they sold him as a slave. And he started a menial task in Potiphar's house. And then through his ability and the grace of God, he was elevated. And I'm sure he said to himself, I'm doing well now. I'm the governor of Potiphar's house. All is well. But friend, the discipline wasn't over. It was only starting. And one day he found himself in a worse plight than ever. He was accused of an awful sin of which he was absolutely guiltless. And he was put in the prison, and he was, it says, his feet were laid in the irons. Joseph didn't know what the Lord was doing, but the Lord knew what he was doing. What I'm doing to you, Joseph, you don't know now, but you'll know hereafter. And one day the butler and the baker came, and the interpretation was given of their dreams. And Joseph said, remember me. Can you hear that word of agony? He says, please remember me when you get out. Remember, I'm a poor prisoner. Help me. But the man forgot all about him. And then one day, Pharaoh had a dream. What the Lord was doing, Joseph didn't know then, but he knew later on. And they brought Joseph to interpret the dream. And Joseph was made a ruler in Egypt, the prime minister of the land to bind the senators of Egypt in their own chains and to teach the children of the river Nile the wisdom of Almighty God. And as Joseph sat on the throne, God said to him, Joseph, you didn't know what I was doing, but you'll know hereafter. And Joseph said, Lord, what about my father? I would love to see him. What about my old father? And the Lord said, Wait a while, Joseph. And the day of famine came, and the brothers came down to Egypt. And you know the story how J Jacob came down to Egypt. Do you ever imagine what a meeting that was when Joseph and his dad met after so long a time? And Joseph's father had long mourned him dead. And I see Joseph putting his arm round his father, and his old father putting his arm round Joseph, and he says, My son, it's really you. What God was doing, Joseph didn't know then, but he knew hereafter. 
And my brethren and sisters in Christ, I have a message from God for you. Don't despair. God's working out His purposes. Don't be alarmed. God is working out His own will to His own glory. Abel knows now why Cain killed him. Joseph knows now why he was sold into Egypt. Paul knows now why he had imprisonments and buffetings. Peter knows now why he was crucified upside down. Yes, all the saints and the martyrs, they know it now. Praise God, someday we too shall understand. And then shall we know even as we also are known. Isn't this a great thought? I was at the open grave on Friday, and I saw the coffin lowered into Mother Earth. And as I stood there, there was sorrow, and there was darkness, and there was despair, and there was anguish. And I thought on this verse, what I'm doing, you don't know now, but you'll know hereafter. And one day that dear saint of God has passed on. Someday she'll join the people of God in her own body. She's joined the church triumphant now in heaven. She's spending her first Lord's Day in the eternal Sabbath of the glory. But praise God, someday that body will rise again. And God will bring it from the dead and stamp upon it immortality and light and glory and make it like unto his own most glorious body. Here's the key. Take it with you. And when life's mysteries surround you and you don't understand what's happening, just trust in the Lord. I went down to see my father and mother after I got out of prison. And my father gave me a little poem by A.B. Simpson. I want to read it to you this morning. It blessed my heart as I read it. It's entitled, It Means Just What It Says. There are some who believe the Bible and some who believe a part. Some who trust with reservation, and some with all their heart. But I know that its every promise is firm and true always. It is tried as the precious silver, and it means just what it says. It assures me of salvation through Jesus' precious blood. For the souls that trust His mercy and yield themselves to God. And I claim for myself the promise and just begin to praise. For it says, I am saved by trusting. And I trust just what it says. And it tells me there is cleansing from every secret sin and a great and full salvation to keep the heart within. And I take him in his fullness with all his glorious grace. For he says... It's mine for the taking, and I take just what it says. And it tells me he will heal me, and hear my feeblest cry, and that all his royal bounty with all my needs supply. And I seem to know no better than trust him all my way. For he says, I may trust him fully, and I trust just what he says. 
It is strange we trust each other and only doubt our Lord. We will take the word of mortals and yet distrust his word. But oh, what light and glory would shine all, all our days if we always would remember that he means just what he says. Praise God, he means it. And I believe it. We don't know what he's doing. And you know the best thing about the verse, it's the Lord that's doing it. You know that. He says, I'm doing it. You say, is the Lord opening the prison door? Yes, he is. Is he putting you in? Yes. Is he giving you hardship? Yes, it's the Lord's doing it. Why? Our light affliction is for a moment, but it worketh an eternal weight of glory. May God bless our hearts for his name's sake. Saint Sabinus. During the reign of Diocletian, Christianity had been expanding for three centuries. And because of the enormous difference in morality between the pagan Greek or Roman religions, it had become a very disturbing influence. However, Diocletian's opposition to the newer religion was motivated by political expediency more than by spiritual considerations. From his talks with Venustian, governor of Etruria, Sabinus the bishop could see that serious trouble was ahead for the church. Sabinus, I'm afraid that unless there's a change of attitude, you Christians are headed for serious trouble. Thank you, Venustian. By change of attitude, you mean, of course, the Christians in the empire must swear allegiance to pagan gods. In the end, that's what it amounts to. And you know that is impossible. As spiritual leader of my people, I must forbid it. But I'm sorry to hear you say this. But regardless of my personal views, I must carry out Diocletian's edict. I understand your position. I hope you can understand mine. Well, it's not a question of you and I understanding each other's position, but that of the emperor. I don't know what is happening to the emperor. So far, he's been tolerant. It's well known that his wife and daughter are favorably inclined to Christianity. First, he's determined to unify the empire. Second, he's under tremendous pressure from his son-in-law, Galerius. Who has a fanatical hatred for Christianity. Well, considering his mother was a priestess, the reason is obvious. Christianity, you might say, has hurt her business and that of other priests. However, this doesn't seem to weigh heavily with Diocletian. Then why should he persecute us? Political and security reasons. What are these political and security reasons? Consider the position of the empire. All around are threatening hordes of barbarians, waiting for the opportunity to destroy our traditional gods. But, Governor, the gods of the Roman Empire... Now bear with me, Sabinus. In your opinion, our gods are false. But that does not make them so. They've served Rome well. Isn't it then necessary once and for all to defend these gods and save Rome from ruin? These gods will avail you nothing at the day of reckoning. I will not go into that kind of a discussion. I want you to know how the wind is blowing so that you can set your sails accordingly. Please continue. Forgive my interruption. In this 300-year period, the Christians have grown in number, and there's somewhere between 20 and 30 million in the empire. Now, you will admit that's a rather high percentage. Doesn't that speak well for the faith the people have in Christ? Now, look at the other side of the coin. But within the empire, there are millions who don't believe in the gods of Rome. And you and Diocletian believe this is dangerous. Decidedly. Our position would be much stronger if these millions had returned to the worship of our ancient gods. The empire would be more compact and our resistance to the barbarians much stronger. These are the arguments Galerius used to sway Diocletian. This is Diocletian's thinking. Galerius plays upon it to get his way. Has the emperor considered 
how much weaker his empire will be if he destroys the millions of Christians. Many who now hold public office, thousands who are in the army, defending the empire against the barbarians. Glarius has had trouble with Christians in the army. Because he demanded that they swear allegiance to pagan gods. He gave a lawful command and they refused to obey. But did they ever refuse to fight against the enemies of Rome? Well... No, not to my knowledge. The record of our Christians in the army is good. They fight to defend their homes and their nation. Well, that wasn't the point at issue. No. Galerius ordered them to renounce their faith. This was a command no true Christian could obey. Well, the fact remains the fighting force on the frontier was weakened and the empire endangered. That's what concerns Diocletian. Now, it's my opinion Galerius will have his way. But no edict has yet been issued. No. Now, the last word was that Diocletian was consulting the oracle of Apollo at Miletus. Uh, pending the result, we may have a uh, moderate policy of Diocletian or a severe policy of Galerius. What would Galerius advocate? In his own words, all those who refuse to make sacrifice will be burnt alive. I thank you for this warning, Benustian. And I hope you will preach to your people and tell them how to avoid bloodshed. I shall prepare them for the edict. And prepare yourself first, Sabinus. I am prepared now. You'll obey? I shall not make sacrifice to a pagan god. I had hoped for a different answer. Did you? Really? Hoped for, not expected. Well, much to my regret, I fear that in a short time you and I will be at war. The Oracle of Apollo, forewarned about the desire of Galerius and aware of his increasing influence, sent back the soothsayer with a decision hostile to the Christians. An edict was drawn up and sent to all parts of the empire. Hear ye! Hear ye! Attention to the edict of the Emperor Diocletian, effective as of this reading. One. All Christians will be stripped of all their privileges and be subject to chastisement. Two, they are forbidden to defend themselves on any charge in the public courts or to make official complaints of injuries, adultery, or theft. An invitation for the mobs to mistreat and rob us. Be silent. Three, Christians who are slaves lose the right of emancipation. Four, the churches will be demolished and all books and writings burned. Deacon, run to the church and tell them to hide the books. Yes, at once, Arthur. Oh, look. Look, it's too late. They've already fired the church. Run. Run. Save what we can. I thought it best to have my soldiers destroy the church while you were all listening to the edict. Now it begins. One who would destroy a faith first burns the house in which it dwells. Only as a warning as to what will come next. Churches can be rebuilt. Yes, Sabinus. And books can be rewritten. Of course, you'll tell me that faith is something carried in one's heart. And I'll agree with you. But you know as well as I that the first move against the man is made against his property. If that doesn't bring him around, well, you know the next move. Only too well. So why not avoid bloodshed and death, which is sure to follow, if this edict doesn't prove as effective as Galerius wishes? Well, Lucien, look at those smoldering ruins. Why do you suppose the flames have completely burned themselves out? Obviously because there's nothing more for them to feed on. So it will be with Galerius's hatred. It will burn out when there are no more Christians to feed it. Sabinus, if you have no regard for your own life, you still have a moral obligation to your flock, as you refer to your people. I was never more aware of it than now. They'll be guided by you. Have you the right to ask them to make martyrs of themselves? Why well, can understand men dying in defense of their homes or their loved ones, but to die for the sake of an in Tangible belief is utter foolishness. Good news, and I really believe you are trying to save my life. The lives of many. 
I hate these persecutions, and I want to head them off. But how can I, without laying myself open to a charge of treason against my emperor? If you regard the emperor as your god, then you must obey him in all things. So be it. The burning of the books in churches was a clever move on the part of the persecutor. For it became a matter of honor for Christians to save their sacred scriptures, even at the cost of their lives. It became apparent that stronger measures would have to be enacted to break the back of Christianity. Accordingly, in 303, Galerius pressured Diocletian to issue two additional edicts. Sabinus, they're coming this way. Hadn't we better run for it? On the contrary, we shall go to meet them. Come. All will follow me. Sabinus, you and your deacons are under arrest. What is the charge? Under the edict of February 24th, all Christians lost their privileges, including that of making complaints in the courts. Since I no longer enjoy civil rights, I must submit to the arrest. I arrest you by edict of the emperor. It consists of two parts. One... All heads of churches shall be imprisoned. I'm ready to go. There's a second provision which will be of interest to you. Heads of churches will be granted freedom if they will sacrifice to the gods. All those who refuse will be submitted to whatever tortures the local official deems fit. Do you want my decision, Venustian? Not now. In prison, you'll have time to think things over. Sabinus and the two deacons were put in prison for several days, during which time they prayed and made their peace with God. Fearing the outcome, Venustian delayed as long as possible in making the final test of Sabinus' tenacity. No doubt he was troubled, but he knew the longer he hesitated, the harder it would be to act and so ordered that Sabinus be led from prison and in the presence of a large crowd make his veneration. Sabinus, are you prepared to make your decision in regard to the edict recently declared by the emperor? I am. I hand you this statue of Jupiter. Take it, I insist. Very well. You will hold the statue aloft and venerate it. Then you may go free. I hold aloft this statue as you command, Governor. Here is my veneration. So, you've broken the statue. Very well. Soldier, draw your sword. Divinus, hold out your two hands. Clasp them together. I hereby order that the hands with which you hurled the statue of Jupiter to the stone be cut off. Soldier. Strike. Down! The two deacons, Marcellus and Exuperantius, also refused to venerate Jupiter. And they were scourged and put on the rack and tormented until dead. The mutilated Sabinus was taken back to prison and was cared for by his fellow prisoners, many of whom were pagan. Venustian returned to his palace and many times asked himself why it was he had not put Sabinus to death as he had the two deacons. Why didn't he hand it back to me or refuse to take it as had so many others? The impulsive thing would have been to behead him on the spot myself. Instead, I punished merely the hands that had committed the act, not the will that prompted it. Therein is the clue. Compromise between my anger, my fear... Not fear of him, no. No, of something else. I'm afraid of the one in whom these Christians believe was sent to save mankind. 
I am afraid of their God. About this time, a cut in event that had a profound effect on Venusian. A widow named Serena would come to the prison each day and beg permission to see Sabinus. When Venusian learned of this, he had her brought before him. I am told you pester the guards every day to let you see Sabinus. Yes, Your Excellency. Why do you wish to see him? Because of my son, who is blind. Blind? How did this begin? He was born that way. So you wish to see Sabinus because of your son? Why? To ask him to cure him. What? Oh, I see. You're a Christian who somehow has escaped our dragnet. No, Excellency. But each day since my son was born, I've asked Jupiter and all the other gods to cure him. And nothing has happened. And do you really believe this Christian God can cure your son? It would do no harm to ask. I've heard strange stories of the man they worship, this Christ. Where did you hear this? I work in a tavern where soldiers gather, many of them Christians. That is, before they were purged from the army. I can't help overhearing talk. Yes, yes, go on. They would read from their sacred book and tell how their Christ healed the blind, the sick, and even brought the dead back to life. Granting all this to be true, what makes you think their God would help one not of their faith? It's told that one of their renowned preachers, one Paul, didn't believe and persecuted the Christians. Then their God sent the light to him and he became a follower. Foolish woman, granting all this, that this Christ had the power to heal. He's been dead many centuries. If he ever had the power, they died with him. It's told that those who preached his gospel carried his power with them. Do many people know you've asked to see Sabinus? Many, but not because of me, Excellency. Crowds would gather when the guards cuffed me and sent me away, and they would jeer and tell the people why I had come. Woman... I am going to permit you to see Sabinus and take your son with you. Oh, the gods be praised. My gratitude will be... Silence. A... I do this so the people may see how foolish you are and how powerless Sabinus is to do anything for you. You may withdraw. I tell this woman it's a test to convince them of folly. But it's hope. A senseless hope. A grasping at a straw. For years your eyes have been afflicted and you're afraid you'll soon be blind yourself. That's why you had the woman brought here and plied her with questions you would ask yourself. If there was not this hope, you would have had her flogged. The Nuschim, the governor, can't put Sabinus to the test, but a foolish woman can. Yes? Woman, why have you come here? This is my son. Here, Marius, this way. Now stand. Sabinus is before you. Your son is blind. Since birth. Mother, is this the man you said could cure my blindness? Yes, my son. Then why is he in prison? Hush. Don't let him know the truth. I'm in prison with my hands cut off because I refuse to venerate a graven image and to acknowledge it as my God. Mother believes you can cure my blindness. Not I, but Christ. Let's go, Mother. Everyone knows Christ died hundreds of years ago. No, no, son. Don't you remember I told you the power lives on in those who believe? Oh, good Sabinus, pay no attention to him. He's but a boy. His blindness has destroyed all hope. But not his mother. I'm a woman of little learning, 
And I don't know the merits of the great dispute now raging. But I have eyes. And when I see people die for an unseen God in whom they believe, I can't help but wonder at this great mystery. And I say to myself, how wonderful it must be to believe in something even more precious than one's own life. I say, Serena, if you know more about this mystery, you too may become like them. Blessed be this mother. Blessed be her son. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the name of your God, thank you. Mother! Mother, my eyes! They hurt! Mother, that over there! I see nothing. Only the sunlight streaming through... My son, he sees. Look! Close to the window. Mother, this warmth I feel on my face, is that the sunlight you've always told me about? Is this the day that's different than the night? This is the light. This is the work of God at the beginning of the world. His son is the light of the world. Give us the light, the light of the world. Baptize us. Let me be first. Please. Water. Give us the light. Woman. Hold the bowl. Now pour it for me over this man's head. I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And many of the prisoners begged for and received baptism. When the soldiers saw Serena coming from the prison, and not leading her son, as when she went in, they were amazed and frightened. And they hastened to tell what had happened to Venustian. At first he refused to believe it. But when he investigated and found the widow's son had been blind from birth, he was convinced. And strangely enough, he was no longer fearful. I should be more afraid now. But somehow I'm not. Can it be that my desire to believe... No. No. My belief in the power of this Christian God is driving out all fear. A mortal man can't accomplish such an act unless... unless he's favored by a divine power. In all our history, there's no record of a priest of Jupiter curing a man of blindness. I must see Sabinus at once. When they took me from prison, I assumed I was going to my death for Lustian. Instead, they brought me to your private room. I sent that blind boy to you as a test. Sabinus, my eyes have been afflicted. I wanted to prove to all that you couldn't cure blindness. I blessed the mother and her boy. God effected the cure. Whether he would see fit to do so in your case... I didn't bring you here to cure me of my affliction. What I ask is a simple thing. One that you've done many times. What do you wish? Give me the water of life. Baptize me as you did those men in prison. You're aware of the meaning of this sacrament. It cleanses man from original and actual sin and makes him a child of God and a member of his church. Here. A bowl of water is at hand. You will have to hold it for me. Pour it slowly over your head. I baptize thee in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Venustian and his wife and children accepted Christianity and were eventually executed. Sabinus was beaten to death at Spoleto and buried a mile from that city. He was one of the many known martyrs. The unknown numbered hundreds of thousands. The sacred books were burned 
The church is destroyed, the faithful tortured to death, but Christianity spreads. St. Stanislaus of Krakow. Well, well. Bishop Stanislaus, good evening. On your way to the palace... To see His Majesty, yes, but first... In a state of anger? He's hardly in a mood for that. Even from his friend, the Bishop of Krakow. Nor am I in a mood for sarcasm from the Duke of Posen. Did you write this letter to me? This one? Huh. Dated January 10th, 1079. Accusing you of spending all your time in the king's court, yet seeing nothing of his adulterous affair with my wife. Yes, yes, I wrote it. Only I didn't know you'd recognize my handwriting. You knew he had taken your wife in adultery. Since the summer of last year? I am not blind. Just wisely afraid. But you said nothing about it. To whom? My wife? The king? And die? Why didn't you come to me? The king's bishop? I am no more his bishop than yours. Aren't you? If I remember correctly, you summoned my wife to the palace in the first place. Not as part of their scheme to live in sin. You wrote the invitation. My wife accepted it. She's in the palace now. She's been there for months. She won't leave, and the king is looking for some pretext to have me slain. I wrote the invitation, yes, that is true. But the king suggested both you and the duchess stay at the palace. A transparent device. Bishop Stanislaus, Poland rocks with shame. She trembles with violent indignation, sick to death of the scandal. Do you expect me to believe you didn't know of it? God is witness to my innocence. I did not know. You know now. And I shall take immediate steps to end it. What? Defy the king? Interfere with his pleasures? You don't seem to take me seriously. No one else dares speak out against him. Why should I expect you to? Because he has committed a cardinal sin. He cannot, he will not go unpunished. After all these years, you're going to chastise the king. What can you do? Where will you start? First, I'll commend the matter to God and ask forgiveness for whatever part I played in it. Dear God, Thy judgment is perfect wisdom, and Thy mercy is full of loving kindness. Be not Thou harsh with me now, although I have been derelict in my duties and deserve Thy wrath. Grant me the wisdom to judge between what is right and loyalty to a much-loved friend. Give me the strength to tear one from the other and the power to do thy holy will. One hundred eighty, one hundred ninety... Two hundred zotis, and now, Carl, the property that the church bought from your Uncle Paul is paid in full. Too bad he died before you raised the final payment. I'm no less happy to give the money to you. As the executor of his estate, I'll deliver the deed after an appropriate period of mourning. Where is His Majesty? In the garden, I think, entertaining the Duchess of Posen and others of his less than fastidious court. These rumors about him the and truth the truth isn't a rumor, Bishop. All Poland talks about how shameful it is. Then it is true. I didn't know until today. 
As close as you are to my uncle, the king. Perhaps I've been too close to Boleslaus to notice his faults. Take my advice. Don't notice them now. The king and the duchess are in love. And besides, you've been too silent too long. Do nothing? Approve of their sin? Haven't you always, Bishop Stanislaus? Carl, what has happened to you? To me? When nothing? Oh, yes, there's something. You've changed. Now you're cold, you're indifferent, almost callous. You might say that I'm a child of my time. You used to be a very devout young man. At one time, you were a deacon of the church, even thought of entering a monastery. That was before, Your Grace. Before. Before what? Before I discovered that you were a hypocrite. No holier than the duchess or the king. All the things you taught me about Christ. I don't think you mean that. Shall I say it again? No, no, will I question your reason for saying it. It's obvious. You're blind to the king's barbarities, indifferent to his immoralities. Yes, that is true, that is true. I have been blind. Bishop Stanislaus, what could you say that I believe now? Nothing. Nothing may God forgive me. I'm a warrior as well as a king. My one ambition is to defeat Germany. So if Conrad II wants to meddle in the affairs of Poland, let him try it. Wine, more wine. Conrad is a good Christian. I share his views. You are a liar and a sinner. <sighs> liar? Sinner? <laughs> and how did I become the mightiest ruler in Europe, huh? Little tricks of the devil? There, indeed, you may speak the truth. Ah, eat your leg of mutton, Bishop. Wash it down with the king's wine. Then remember your impoverished childhood. Compare the hardship of it with the luxuries at your disposal now, as Bishop of Krakow. My mother and my father were poor. They were old before that time. Severe privation sapped much of their happiness. But in another way, they were very fortunate. They believed in our Lord Jesus Christ. Their faith made them young again, and I was born as a crown to their devotion. And in gratitude, they reared me to serve God. <laughs> and now look at you, huh? <laughs> Dining with royalty at the right hand of the king. That makes me no less a servant of the Lord. I'm still bound to execute his bidding. No matter the cost. I, no matter the cost, no matter the pain, mine or yours. Meaning what? God forbids adultery. Even by the King of Poland and the Duchess of Posen. What are you trying to do? Twist our friendship in the wrong direction? Twist it. I'm trying to set it straight. The way it was before you pulled me away from my religious responsibilities. Well, my laxities are at an end now. And so is your illicit affair with the Duchess. <laughs> I suggest we change the subject. No, no. God doesn't ask my reticence. He demands your confession and repentance. I'm warning you, Ben. And I'm warning you. In the name of God, I command you and the Duchess to confess your sins, do penance, and pray that God will accept it as atonement for your immoral conduct. You dare accuse your king of adultery? You dare command him to confess his sins? You dare! I'll await you and the Duchess in the confession. Gods! Take the bishop to my chamber now! Before I send him to the dungeon instead... I thought we were friends. Have I held you in less esteem than you've expressed for me? Evidently you despise me. You just publicly accused me of adultery. Was it a false accusation? That's beside the point. Have I accused you unjustly? You know whether it's true or not. But before you turn sanctimonious and condemn me, remember my generosity as an act of charity. I do not question your benevolence. I challenge your sinful conduct. I'm a normal human being. Is that a sin? I know you're human. I know your faults. But to violate your royal duty to the people, to disobey the laws of God, and you've done both with pride, you've turned away from God. Who you... the devil do you think you're talking to? I'm the king. The people are my subjects. They must guard their conduct before me. And you must guard yours before God. My behavior justifies itself. What? Do I understand you correctly? 
Evidently, you don't understand me at all. Do you suggest that your sovereignty exempts you from mortal sin? I suggest the facts of history. Kings are beyond all wrongs by virtue of their royal blood. And believing that, you took the Duke's wife? Took her. With force? Threats of violence? Like a wild animal? <laughs> Certainly not. She joined you in this crime willingly? And she can walk out of it just as easily. In that case, the severity of sin is twofold. Unless you repent and do it soon. I will not be preached to like a rough. You stand in judgment of the law. And you stand in judgment of the king. God exists because I choose to believe it. But what if I didn't believe? What if I said Jesus was a man, only a man, like you and me? What if your holiness then and his? Christ is divine. Don't you ever say he is not. I'm a king. I speak as I choose. Not of God unless the Satan in you deliberately invites excommunication. Excommunication? You dare threaten me with severance from the church? Yes, and the bountiful goodness of God's grace. That is the price you and the Duchess must pay. Confession and repentance or excommunication. That's your ultimatum. Well, here's mine. A public apology to me and the Duchess. Or I swear, by all the powers of my command, I'll strip you of your ring and crozier. This ring is a symbol of my marriage with the Holy Catholic Church. The crozier signed of my pastoral office. They were given to me by the Pope. And only he can take them away. You heard my terms. If you doubt my sincerity... You have no right, Boleslas. None whatsoever. All rights are mine by power of the sword. Now, if you think I shall not carry out my threat... Just say Mass tomorrow and don't apologize. Bishop, you know what he's capable of. You must apologize. To the king and your wife? No, no. That would be the same as publicly declaring that I approved of their sins. Don't force him to use violent means. He would, you know. If it would suit his aim. I beg God's forgiveness for being a tool in their scheme. I will not beg theirs for having used me. Conrad II has offered asylum. Come with me to Germany. We'll be safe there. But if you leave now without putting up a fight against the king's behavior with your wife, what chance have I to win public support against them? None. And when the king petitions the pope, you won't have support from the nobles either. The king petitioning the pope? Against me? He'll say you made his sins public only after your part in them became known to the people. That's a lie. The Pope won't believe it. Who can tell a lie from the truth these days? I'll show you. Let's pretend I'm the Pope. One, you stop making regular visits to the churches of your diocese. Why? Two, you're accused of saying Mass only for those of noble birth. And there's your relationship with the King. Explain your attachment to him. Three, did his benevolence blind you to his brutal treatment of the people? Did it close your eyes to his scandalous behavior with the Duchess of Posen? Come, Bishop, think also of how you must have appeared to the people. They saw you with the king. They knew you liked him. Then it follows you must have approved of his behavior. I cannot be guided by the false conclusions of the people. Apologize, Bishop. Save your skin. I must do what is right. My carriage is waiting. Come with me to Germany. I'm sorry. Tomorrow is Sunday. I shall say Mass. And I shall pray that you have a safe journey. <laughs> I ordered him to apologize. Instead, he resorted to new accusations. Knowing the type of man he truly is, Uncle, did you expect him to do it? As king, yes. I believe I have a right to expect obedience from my subjects. For the bishop's sake, I'm sorry he disappointed you. Sorry? For him? What about me? He's using the church to strike at me and the duchess. And not only that, Bishop Stanislaus is turning the people against us. Pretty soon we won't be able to show our faces lest the peasants throw stones at us. Perhaps they know he's right. Huh. Do they? I wonder. For example, how would he look to them if, by some devious means, we could discredit him? Uh, say as a cheat. Uh, 
caught misappropriating the church's funds? Bishop Stanislaus? A cheat? Who'd believe it? <laughs> the same riffraff who adore him now. Oh, no. They wouldn't believe he'd steal. Ah, uh, don't underestimate the ignorance of the public. Now, suppose he didn't pay my brother Paul for the property the new church is being built upon. But he did. He made the final payment to me. After Paul's death, you see? Uncle, the point is he paid. Well, did you give him the deed? Not yet. It can't be touched until the will has been read. Did you give him a receipt? No, no, I didn't. Come to think of it, neither did Uncle Paul. You know how close they were. Well, then! But, Uncle, <laughs> it wouldn't be right. You want to govern Bohemia, don't you? Of course. Just as you promised. But still... About nothing. Bishop Stanislaus is a cheat. He used that money for his own aims, didn't he? As far as I know, yes. Ah. Now let him prove his innocence to the tribunal. I'll select the judges myself with infinite care. Bishop Stanislaus. Hmm? No? Who's there? It's dark. I... It's I, Carl. Oh. Are you all right? Except for a few minor discomfitures, I, I am. We haven't much time. I bribed the guards. They let me in just for a moment. Aren't you here for the king? No. I came in secrecy so that I could kneel before you and ask you to forgive me. For bearing false witness against me? Yes. And for calling you a hypocrite. My son, I forgive you for whatever wrong you did me. Now stand up. Go to the church, make a full confession, and receive the holy sacrament. Before I go, I must tell you the news. I went to the judges. I told them everything. They laughed, said I was trying to protect you. The Pope will hear of it eventually. He'll intervene in my behalf. He already has. In a letter to the tribunal... But the king refuses to make it known. Don't you understand? Your trial will continue. You have three days to prove your innocence. They hope the strain will force you to yield. Let them. The Pope knows I am not guilty. But you can't prove it to the people. Only because the judges are in collusion to convict me. For the king. What of your royal friends now? They stand by in obvious fear of helping you. While they let no. you... No, not all of them. There's Prince Paul. He's dead. What happens when we die, Carl? Wait. God recalls the soul from the body. I shall pray for him to restore Prince Paul's. Your grace, that's impossible. For God, who conceived the soul and created the human body to house it? Bishop, Prince Paul has been... Dead for many weeks. And what is time to God if he chooses to ignore it? If my uncle had died today or yesterday... Even then, would you truly believe that God would raise him from the dead? It would be a miracle. You must go now. The tribunal has given me three days to prove my innocence. Very well. I shall devote every moment to prayer. And if it is the will of God, Prince Paul will rise and bear witness to my innocence. Carl, come in here. The judges will convene shortly, Uncle. We'll be late for the start of the trial. You think you're clever, don't you? I don't understand. Uncle. Don't play innocent with me. I heard about that guilty conscience act you put on for the tribunal a few days ago. I also know about your visit to the dungeon. Since you know the truth, I won't bother to deny it. I see. Suddenly, you're very courageous. Not especially. I simply renewed my faith in God. I've resumed my duties as deacon of the church. You fool. Are you prepared to give up all I promised because Bishop Stanislaus has talked of God? He influences me toward a better life, Uncle. Well, his three days are up. Let him influence the tribunal. Uncle, call off the trial. Call it off? Why should I? There's nothing to gain. He's innocent. The Pope knows it's all a malicious scheme. Poland no longer recognizes the authority of the Pope. Tomorrow I shall declare myself head of the Polish Catholic Church. 
You wouldn't dare. Wouldn't I? What's to stop me? Bishop Stanislaus, he'd never allow you to do it. After the trial, the bishop will be in jail. The people will stop you. They'll fight and win. The people will always be just that. The people. Uncle, listen to me. Don't do it. You mustn't. Conrad II has joined forces with the Duke of Posen. His German troops are ready to die, if only to protect Bishop Stanislaus from any punishment you might impose. If you defile the sanctity of the church... Conrad II and the Duke will perish in war. Do you mean you deliberately drag Poland into a senseless bloodbath? To protect the sovereignty of the Polish throne? Yes, yes. For what? Your ego? For that harlot, the Duchess? Shut up about her. Shut up. The Duchess and I will leave for my castle in Galicia. As soon as the judges find Bishop Stanislaus guilty of his crime, he will not be found guilty. If there is truly a God in heaven, the bishop will go free. Or Poland is lost. The judges of this tribunal have been most patient. I thank each of you for allowing me time to produce evidence of my innocence. Have you no other witness to speak in your behalf? None, Excellency. I am witness. King, traitor, tool of Satan. It's Paul. My brother Paul, oh, merciful God, he's come back from the dead. Take him away. Take him away. I bow in shame before Christ, my Lord. I beseech him to forgive my sins. Humbly ask for the strength to serve my penance and amend my iniquitous life. In the name? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Majesty, an auspicious beginning, at least. Oh, for the love of God, stop persecuting me! Come to Mass. Receive the Blessed Sacrament. Only then will your act of contrition be complete. All right! Now leave me alone. When shall I expect you? Soon. Tomorrow, perhaps, then. Perhaps is indefinite, and tomorrow never comes. I'm still a sick man. The shock of seeing my brother was too much for me. I need time to recover. The prince is back in his grave, and you must come to the cathedral just the same. What purpose? That can't be served just as well here in the palace. You must humble yourself before the people. No, never. Don't ask me again. You must. I cower to God when I made that confession. But I will not grovel before my subjects. As part of your penance, you'll do as I say. You'll show the people that you regret your sins. You get out of here. You get out! The people are growing impatient, Bishop. Shall I signal the start of Mass now? Wait for the king. I didn't want to tell you this. Now I must. Last night, the king and the duchess went to his palace in the south of Poland. And he leaves me no alternative but to break his connection with the church. Bishop, please, think it over. Excommunicate the king. Would that be wise? You know he'd never forgive you. He might even... Well, if I did anything less than make this move against him, I'd never forgive myself. I cannot destroy my soul by sharing the king's sin. I'll declare him excommunicated. And humiliate me like this. Expel me from the church, not while I live. Rescind the order now, here and now. We stand before the altar of God. Put away that sword. Three times today I sent soldiers to kill you. Each time they came back quivering like babies. A bright light from heaven frightened them. Well, I see no such light. Now, either you reinstate me or... When you desecrate the church by being here, my decision stands. God's will be done. God's will and mine. And mine! <laughs> By whose will do you die, Bishop Gods? Or mine, Boleslaus, King of Poland? Gods, the will of my Redeemer. You've come back too late. The bishop is dead. It isn't much comfort, Carl, but Poland is free. Boleslaus has been overthrown in battle. And unless he asks 
God to forgive him his soul is doomed for all time. In his madness, he murdered our bishop, a saintly man. He struck him down before the altar of God. Cooperation with Fuller Seminary proudly presents the Old Fashioned Revival Hour, a broadcast of the Gospel with Dr. Charles E. Fuller. Touch their hearts of gold. 
is on the earth and will to men from hands of gracious king. From world in solemn stillness and to hear the angels sing. Still from the fallen skies they come with peaceful wings of bird, and still their heavenly music floats o'er all the weary world. Above its sad and lonely plains they bend on hovering wings, and ever o'er its fatal sounds the blessed angels sing. For though the days are hasting on, my prophet parts are told, when will the ever-circling years come from the age of old? When they shall over all the earth its ancient slander stream, and the whole world give back the song which now the angels sing.
to take your Bibles and open them to the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And mothers out in the homes, you just let the things go now in the kitchen. Gather your family around the radio. Open your Bibles. And across the nations now, just listen carefully and closely and attentively to the reading of a few verses in Luke, the second chapter. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Notice how simple it is, just plainly given forth, simple word. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. 
And all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told by them by the shepherd. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. Now remember, the sowing of God's word never returns void. And God has given you and me a great privilege of sowing this incorruptible seed to a worldwide audience. And I'm thankful for the privilege of reading these first 20 verses of God's holy word out of the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Oh. 
Jesus, no crying he makes. I love the Lord Jesus, look down from the sky and stay by my cradle till morning.
Come on this Christmas day and kneel in the presence of the babe in the manger of Bethlehem 
and accept him as your Savior. For as many as receive him, to those that receive him, God gives the power to become the sons of God, even to those that believe on his name. And him that cometh unto me, God says, I will in no wise cast out. How sweet to know the mind of God that he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Heavenly Father, take thy word and speak and send it to the hearts of those that are in great need and may many be won and wooed by the Holy Spirit to accept the Christ of eternity as their Savior. For we ask it in Jesus' name. This is Charles E. Fuller bidding you goodbye and may God's richest blessings rest upon you. for the light to cause the lamps to burn continually in the tabernacle of the congregation, and it shall be a statute forever in your generation. The Eternal Light. National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations present The Eternal Light. This public service program is presented under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Today's radio drama, If Not Higher, written by Norman Rostin, is based on the famous short story of the same name by Isaac Loeb Perrett. Once upon a time in the village of Nemirov, there lived a rabbi, a righteous man, a wise man. He was well versed in the books of devotion, and yet he did not like some men set learning above all else. But we are ahead of our story. It is a simple story, and we will begin at the beginning. It is the evening before Friday at Sikos time, which is the week of penitential prayers before the new year. And the rabbi is leaving the house of study with his friends, humming a little tune. The rabbi is at peace with the world tonight. A fine evening, a fine world. Do you think it will rain tomorrow, David? You are the wise man, rabbi. Why do you ask me? In such things as the weather, no man is wise. What say you, Abram? Rain or no? No. Good. Uh, I'm no authority, mind you, rabbi. It will not rain. Enough. Shall we see what early morning service, then? Uh, tomorrow is Friday, is it not? Friday, yes. I will not be at the early morning services. At the house of study, then? No. Then the rabbi will be at home, eh? Not at home, either. Oh. Ah. And so, good evening to you, friends. I must leave. Uh, good evening, Rabbi. Good evening and good health. And so it was that every Friday morning early at Sleepos time, the Rabbi of Nemirov disappeared, melted into thin air. He was not to be found anywhere, either in the synagogue or in the two houses of study, and most certainly not at home. His door on this particular morning stood open. People went in and out as they pleased. No one ever stole anything from the rabbi. And there was not a soul in the house. 
And every year, Friday morning early at Sleepers time, there was the same speculation. So, again he is gone. Vanished. Where can the rabbi be, Grandpa? Is it likely, do you think, that a rabbi should have no affairs on hand with a solemn day so near? Where can the rabbi be? Where should he be if not in heaven? And so they believed it, and it troubled them no further. Jews need a livelihood, peace, health. But Satan, with his thousand eyes, spies out the world from one end to the other, and he sees and accuses and tells tales. And who shall help if not the rabbi? So talked the people each year on the Friday morning at Sleeper's time, and all was well. Once, however, there came to the village a Lithuanian, a learned Talmudist, and he dared to laugh. <laughs> oh! <laughs> in heaven, huh? Oh, forgive me, the rabbi in heaven! <laughs> Oh, 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 I split from laughing. In all my life. <laughs> Are you finished, Lithuanian? Uh, 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 finished. <laughs> finished. Uh, you are acquainted with our rabbi? I have not had that pleasure. I'm passing through your village. Then pass through quickly or hold your tongue. Why? Is it not a custom to laugh in your village? Not against our rabbi. Well, who, who laughs against your rabbi? I laugh against the general idea you will forgive me a man, holy though he may be, going to heaven one morning and returning by noon. Is that impossible? Definitely. How do you know it's impossible? Uh, have any of you ever seen the rabbi either going or coming from that celestial place? Has he ever himself, righteous man though he is, I do not doubt, ever spoken of such a visit? He would not speak of it. He's a modest man. Definitely impossible. But before the holy days, uh, a miracle perhaps. Definitely uh, no. You are a bore. Ah, uh, you tell me this. You stuff yourself with learning, but but when it comes to a thing as simple as this... No. It is simple to walk into heaven just as one pleases. I beg you to show me how, good friend. Go to heaven and bring me back some divine evidence, if you please. Do that, if you please, and I will believe you. Prove otherwise. Perhaps. Perhaps. Prove otherwise or hold your tongue. Ah, the devil with you. Here we're living at peace and you come in with your, if you please. Prove the rabbi cannot visit heaven. And by the book, if you please. And who else but such a man as this, the good Lord bless him, would go through the books? And who else would come up with proof, even as it was asked of him? Who else but this Lithuanian passing through the village of Nemirov? And so I pointed out to you, right here in the Gomorrah, the holy Talmud of our wise ancestors, plainly written, even Moses, our teacher, could not ascend into heaven, but remain suspended 30 inches below it. So you have it. The incident is closed. No. And what becomes of the rabbi? I don't know, and I don't care. The incident is closed. I ask you, who's going to argue with such a scholar? He may be a good Jew, a good husband and father, a man of faith and of learning. Yet you see by his high-handed manner that he is a man apart. So thought the cronies of the rabbi, and yet he had disturbed them. He had quoted from the Gomorrah. It was plain enough. Soon he will leave the village. We'll have peace again. Of all the villages, he had to come to Nemer. Is it true, though, what he spoke? Ah, uh, plague upon his mouth. Is it true? Our rabbi does not go to heaven at Sweet House time? He goes, lad. He goes. He must go. Where else could he be? He is not upon earth. Where else could he be? Can we not ask the rabbi himself? No, no. We ask the rabbi nothing. Perhaps, Abram, perhaps it, uh, it would do no harm. Do we think so little of our rabbi that we question him? You surprised me, David. I was only thinking... To ask the rabbi such a thing to his face? Never. The man who would do that, the Lord would strike dead. And may I ask you, rabbi, to your face, if you will forgive me, where you are on Friday early before Salikos time? <laughs> and why must you know, huh? Curiosity. Where I am, huh? I am about... I am at work. But exactly where? I have always admired you Lithuanian scholars. You know the Talmud only too well. I'm glad you think so. I'm honored, Rabbi. Now, in the Gomorrah, it states that even Moses, our father, could not ascend into heaven, but remain suspended 30 inches below. Correct? Correct. So? So? What? The moral is clear, is it not? How do you mean? Men should not go around imagining themselves visiting heaven. And men should not go around imagining themselves the keepers of the souls of others. The moral is clear, is it not? Hmm. So, 
It is late. I merely stopped in to acquaint myself with you, Rabbi. You are well loved here. I try to live by the ways of God. True, true. And the ways of God are often not accountable to man. And his ways are often so simple to confound man, as you are confounded, my good friend. Be not troubled by what concerns you not. Come again. You are welcome to this house. The Lithuanian, hardy soul that he was, began to brood over this matter as the days went on. So certain were the townsfolk that their rabbi consulted the Lord for them at Sleko's time, and so certain was the stranger that their rabbi did nothing of the sort, that his soul was in torment. The Lithuanian was ashamed of the doubt in his heart, and yet... Being a man of learning, he could not allow himself to believe this thing, and so he brooded. Then the time came for his wife and himself to continue on to their destination. So, tomorrow then we set out. Eh? Huh? Oh, yes, of course. I'm deep in thought. In Galicia, there will be more work and less thought for you, my husband. Galicia? Well, why do we travel there, tell me? Have you forgotten? My sister has a farm. So we shall eat stone. What's the matter with you? The rabbi. Who? Rabbi. Ah, there's a challenge. He smiles and he smiles and he's silent as a picture. Can it be true he visits heaven? Begin your packing. I don't leave. Pack your things. I don't leave. I've decided once and for all I stay. What is Galicia? What awaits me there, work? I stay here to unravel a mystery. What are you babbling about? I must know. Where does the rabbi go on sleepless time? I must know. How long before this madness leaves you? Tell me. Until Sleeko's time comes round again. A year? What is a year when it comes to the solitude of the soul? What is a year when such things are at stake? The matter is settled. Now, good wife, bring me my tea. There's a chill in the air. And so our good friend stays on in the village. The seasons pass. While others crowd around the rabbi in admiration, the Lithuanian remains friendly but aloof. In time, all in time, his eyes seem to say, he must doubt until he is shown otherwise. For he is no barbarian but a learned man, an inquisitive man, a seeker of truth. And he waited for his time. And he had a plan. Ah, and so we approach the new year, David. If his time will be soon here again. Ah, yes, another year. Sometimes when I ponder the passing seasons, I ask in truth what I have done with my life. Uh, ask instead for a better winter than the one we had. It would be more practical. Winter? Uh, did you say a bad winter? Child's play. Now in Lithuania, there you get a taste of winter to freeze a man's soul. I do not mean to be inquisitive. But uh, why did you leave that beautiful land of your birth? My wife, hmm. a woman with ambition. And she has a sister with a farm in Galicia. But Galicia is... is very far from Nemirov, I know. Tell us, why did you not leave our village? I to speak truthfully, my friends. I am leaving. You go, but when? When? Soon. At the Sleekers' time, to be exact. Ah. Oh. Sleekers' time. And do not now amuse me with the story of your pious rabbi who consults with the Almighty in heaven early Friday morning on Sleekers' time. You still doubt our rabbi friend? Perhaps. Yeah. Ah, he is steamy. I see by his eyes and that smile. What are you dreaming up, Lithuanian? I do not see. I merely wait. You will see. The miracle will take place before your very eyes. We are two days before Friday. Try to find the rabbi early Friday morning. Go, look for him wherever you want. Search the synagogue, search the house of study. Look in his home, look under his bed. You will find him nowhere. Nowhere on this earth, at any rate. And if he is not on earth, then he must be in heaven. <laughs> The Lithuanian waited for the day to come and smiled as he waited, the taste of his triumph lighting up his face, for he had a plan. And his wife, patient woman, eyed him suspiciously and wondered. Finally, Thursday evening came. He watched the last red glow of the sunset and waited for darkness to slip down. Then, instead of preparing for bed as was his habit, he began to put on his coat and cap. And where, may I ask, are you off to at this hour of night? I'm going for a walk. A walk at this hour?
fetch it. I'll tell you then. I'm not only... Well, a man has a right to stretch his legs and breathe some air without asking permission of his wife or have time changed. I will not permit it. You do not permit it, huh? No. Well, I'll tell you then. I'm not only going for a walk. I'm going for the whole night. And I shall not be back till tomorrow. Are you mad? Till tomorrow. Oh, I knew it. I knew it, fool, that I am. I should have huh? been dead. Twenty years married and now this. Now this. Quiet. Stop your wailing. <laughs> have I not been a good wife to you? Have I not humored your whims? Oh, nursed that... you when you were sick, worked for you all these years, oh. and now you bring this shame oh. upon me. Oh. Stop your foolish nonsense. <laughs> nonsense. Nonsense, you call it. Who is she? Now I see it all. You did not want to go to Galicia, and it was because of her. If for just one minute you leave that tongue of yours, I'll speak. Speak then, but speak well. There is no other woman. And I tell you, in a week we leave for Galicia. You have my word. Not a woman? Why then does a man leave his home at night? Just this. The rabbi. Again? My hour of triumph is at hand. That's why we stayed on for a whole year. Tomorrow is Friday before Sleeker's time. And I, your husband, will find out just what the rabbi of Nemirov does on that morning. And how do you propose to find out? Tonight I sleep with the rabbi. Sleep with the rabbi? Well, not with him exactly. He shall sleep on the bed, I under the bed. Farewell. The moon lit a path bright as daylight as he crept to the window of the rabbi's bedroom. And why on this special night did the moon have to act like it was a guest at a wedding? Anyone who would care to look would be able to see our friend about his nocturnal duties. And the Lithuanian himself, who scoffed at the idea of ghosts or witches, on this night felt a strange prickle around his scalp and down his back. His hands were on the window. A push, quietly, and now it is done. He listens, cautious, and hears... It is the rabbi, no mistake. So far, so good. With his hands on the sill, he hoists himself up. Listen. He slips into the room, carefully makes his way across the room, and in his haste to get under the bed, trips on a chair. He did not breathe. To this day, he swears that for five minutes he did not breathe. Now he stretched himself out on the hard floor, his eyes wide, staring at the mattress above him, and listened to the peaceful breathing of the rabbi. Another would have dozed and slept his time away. Not our Lithuanian. He listened and thought as the night wore on. Snore peacefully, my heavenly friend. Lithuanian is a patient man. He can wait long. You thought to take his secret to the grave, eh? That was before you dealt with such a one as I. I shall soon find you out. Consult with the Almighty, huh? We shall soon see. <laughs> well, in truth, it's not too comfortable here. Not that I'm frightened. Of course I'm not. It's true, my knees seem to knock against the floor against my will, but then it's cold in here. How about a slight chill anyway? <laughs> huh? <laughs> it's only an animal. A spirit, perhaps. Perhaps I'm being warned by unearthly power to end my skin. That's such a great joke, after all, to be left alone with a rabbi at this time before dawn. Maybe it will better to leave and forget this bit. <laughs> Too late. Too late. <sighs> the rabbi was awake. The Lithuanian listened to him sighing and groaning for a whole hour. Whoever has heard the groaning of the rabbi of Nemirov knows what sorrow for all Israel, what distress of mind found voice in every groan. Any soul hearing would be dissolved in grief, except the Lithuanian. He hears and lies still. Finally, the rabbi, long life to him, rises. The Lithuanian watches, perspiring, as the rabbi goes to the wardrobe and takes out a packet, which proves to be the clothes of a peasant. The rabbi begins to dress himself. First the trousers, then high boots, the peasant blouse, a wide felt hat, and finally a thick cord which he ties about his blouse. And is this the way our rabbi clothes himself to get to heaven? Well, soon I shall know. You ready now, rabbi? Don't look behind you now, I pray. What's this? A hatchet? Yes, the rabbi stooped and picked a hatchet from under his mattress, at the same time almost brushing the Lithuanian's nose. He put the hatchet in his belt and left the house, humming a little tune. The Lithuanian follows. A 
fearful hush broods over the half-dark streets. The rabbi keeps to the side and walks in the shadow of the houses. He glides from one to the other. And the Lithuanian hears the sound of his own heartbeats mingle with the heavy footfall of the rabbi. But he follows on, and together they emerge from the town. Behind the town stands a little wood, and the rabbi, long life to him, enters. And what, praise God, does the rabbi want in these woods? And at dawn, in peasant clothes with a hatchet in his belt. Oh, what's this? A tree? Now, why cut down a tree in this forest? What can the rabbi be up to? The Lithuanian saw the rabbi strike blow after blow, and the little tree falls. And the rabbi splits it up into logs and the logs into splinters. Then he makes a bundle, binds it up with the cord, throws it over his shoulder, and slowly walks back into town. And the Lithuanian follows some distance behind and begins to marvel at what he has seen. It is now growing light. The world stirs. If this is the way to heaven, then indeed it's a strange road. Yet I will follow this to the end. If he disappears into the air, I will see it. He saw the rabbi stop before a poor, tumble-down little house on one of the back streets and tap upon the window. The rabbi enters. Our friend hurries to the window, kneels, and listens. Wood to sell? And where would I get the money to buy wood? I am taken to bed, as you can see. I will give you six groschen worth on credit. <laughs> How am I ever to repay you? There is no money. Oh, see here. You are a poor, sick widow. And I am willing to trust you with a little bundle of wood. I believe in time you will repay me. Oh. You have a great and mighty God. And you do not trust him. Not even to the amount of a miserable six groschen for a bundle of wood. If you say so, you are so kind. But who, who is to light the stove? My son away and I weak in bed? I will also light the stove for you. <laughs> And the Lithuanian peeped over the windowsill, and there was the rabbi laying the wood in the stove very carefully. As the stove lit up, the wood crackled cheerily. Yes, what is it? I have wood to sell. Oh, we, we cannot buy. I will leave it, and God be with you. It is charity. I, I cannot... It is not charity. It is wood. Your house is cold. Take it. Take it and say no more. And the Lithuanian saw all this and realized that though the rabbi's heart may have been upon heaven, his deeds were upon earth and given unto the people. And he felt a sudden love and warmth for this quiet man. And the Lithuanian ran swiftly to his home, opened the door. Good morning, my, my best clothes. Fetch my new blouse, my belt, my good cap. Make tea. Oh, he's seen the devil. He's mad, my boy. Hurry, I'll be late for the morning service. The service? At the synagogue. What then? Are we not good Jews? Uh, Do you not know that this is Friday before Sleekel? And what of Galicia? You promised it. Here in Nemirov, we have a rabbi. A man, indeed, who does wondrous things. I intend to become a disciple of this holy man, for I have seen his piety. We stay here. It is settled. And now, my clothes, and a comb to trim my beard, at once. <coughs> And it came to pass that as Slichos time rolled around each year, the legend of the rabbi once again was upon the lips of the people. And there was always a young lad who, having heard the tale, nevertheless asked the question. And where does the rabbi go at Slichos time if he is nowhere to be found? Where should he go, my bright lad? If not to heaven? Surely with the holy days approaching, our rabbi has affairs of importance to take up with the Almighty. Yes. Is that not so, my good Lithuanian friend? And would you not find the rabbi in heaven? And the Lithuanian, the man who once dared to laugh at this question, now turned to the child and said in a hushed voice, Most certainly in heaven, my boy, if not higher. And now we take pleasure in presenting on the eternal light Rabbi Elliot M. Burstein of Congregation Beth Israel, San Francisco. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai once asked his disciples, What is the best thing for man to acquire? 
A good eye, said one. A good friend, said another. A good neighbor, said a third. Vision suggested a fourth. And then, said the saintly Rebeliaza ben Arach, a good heart. Whereupon Reb Yochanan addressed the others, saying, I prefer Eliezer's answer to yours, for in his words, yours are included. Our religion is essentially a silken cloth into whose woof and warp are woven the threads of social idealism. It is revealed in the thunderings of the Moses. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and soul and might, and thy neighbor as thyself. In the warnings of the Micah, what the Lord doth require of thee, only to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. In the gentle summations of the Hillel, what is hateful to thee, do not unto thy fellow. All else is commentary. It is found in the sayings of the ancient sages, Ohev ha-mokum, ohev ha He who loves God must love God's creatures. And Rahman and Liba boy, above all else, God wants the heart. The Nemirava rabbi knew and believed this, and also that man is here on earth for the specific purpose of pleasing God. And how is that to be accomplished? By helping those of God's children who need help most. We are now in the midst of our ten days of repentance, a period during which the Jewish people, like the Nemerava rabbi, lays bare his sullied soul to God and asks his forgiveness. And in three ways he tries to prove his sincerity, through penitence, prayer, and charity. It is easy, he knows, to weep Pray and speak words that come from the heart. Words alone will not suffice. They must be garnished with tadaka, compassion translated into action. And it is only after he shall have performed some deeds of kindness and mercy that the gates of heaven, the ears of God, will be opened to him. Josiah Holland declared, I hold this thing to be grandly true. A noble deed is a step toward God. The Nemirava rabbi believed it to be a passport into God's presence. And was it perhaps of him that George Eliot thought, when she penned her immortal lines. So to live is heaven, to make undying music in the world. May I reach that purest heaven. Be to other souls the cup of strength in some great agony. And kindle generous ardor, feed pure love. So shall I join the choir invisible, whose music is the gladness of the world. If Not Higher was dramatized for the eternal light by Norman Roston and was based on a short story by Isaac Loeb Perrin. The music was composed and conducted by Morris Mamorsky. Cantor Robert H. Siegel of the Beacon Street Temple, Brookline, Massachusetts, was the soloist. Joe DeSantis was featured as the Lithuanian and Juano Hernandez as the rabbi. Bernard Lenro was the narrator. The entire production was under the direction of Frank Pat. The Eternal Light program will not be heard next Sunday because of the Jewish holiday of Sukkot. This program has been a public service presentation of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations and was brought to you under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. This is the National Broadcasting Company. unto thee pure oil olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamps to burn continually in the tabernacle of the congregation, and it shall be a statute forever in your generation. <laughs>
National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations present The Eternal Light. This public service program comes to you each week under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Today's program, written by Morton Wishingrad, is entitled The Talmud and features Alexander Scorby as the narrator. Only one man was created by God as the common ancestor of all for the sake of the peace of the human race. That one may not say to another, my ancestor was better than thine. The Wisdom of the Talmud. The Wisdom of the Talmud on bringing up children. Do not threaten a child. Either punish or forgive. On an evil tongue. The tongue of slander kills three. Him who slanders, him who is slandered, and him who listens. On silence. If silence be good for the wise, how much better for fools. On true wisdom. Who is wise? He who can learn from every man. Who is strong? He who can control his passions. Who is rich? He who can feel satisfied with his lot. Who is honored? He who honors mankind. There is a vast literature filling many volumes bearing the impress of holy men and sweet minds, which has stood like a rampart for nearly 2,000 years. The Hebrew verb was lamed, to teach, and the noun was Talmud, teaching. The Talmud may be divided into two parts. Halacha, law, Agada, legend. The poet Bialik says, Agada is the air we breathe. Halacha is the ground we stand on. The face of Halacha is stern. The face of Agada is gay. Now, from the storehouse of Agada, a parable. his wanderings to the east, it chanced that Alexander the Great came to the very gates of paradise. He knocked on the sacred portal, and an angel answered. Who is there? Alexander. Alexander? Who is Alexander? Alexander. You know, the Alexander. Alexander the Great, conqueror of the world. We know him not. This is the Lord's gate. Only the righteous enter here. Then I am not admitted? No. Please. Only the righteous enter here. Well, then give me a sign that I have been to the gates of heaven. Anything at all. I just want it for proof to my wise men. Very well. Here. This? It will do. What is it? A fragment of human bone. A fragment from the skull bone that surrounds the human eye. Take it to your wise men, Alexander. Tell them to weigh it. Place the bone in one scale, Alexander. Very good, Your Majesty. Well, you're the wise men. What next? We shall weigh the bone. Place some gold coins in the other scale. Why, this is ridiculous. Any schoolboy knows gold weighs more than bone. Do as we say. Very well. I don't understand. The bone weighs more than the gold. Add more gold. Still more. 
And still more. Alexander, add silver. Now, Alexander, add your scepter and your crown jewels. There's some trick here. I see it with my own eyes, but I don't believe it. Alexander, this insignificant fragment of human bone weighs more than your entire treasury. Is that the meaning? Not yet, Alexander. The gold and the silver in your crown jewels, where are they? Nearly touching the ceiling, outweighed by a splinter of bone. Now, Alexander, reach to the ground and take some dust in your hand. Do as I say, Your Majesty. A little will suffice. Well, sprinkle the dust on the bone. Just sprinkle it? Yes. As you say. I saw it happen. I must believe it. But I don't believe it. A few grains of dust upset the scale. Alexander, listen to me. What was the bone? That part of the skull which surrounds the human eye. Nothing will ever satisfy the human eye. Nothing except the dust of earth, which is the grave. Wise man, is that the whole meaning? Something more, Alexander. When a child is born, the little hand is clenched. As if the child is saying, see, the whole world is within my grasp. But when a man dies, the hand is open. And he says, everything I have taken from life, I now return. I go empty to the grave with no earthly possession save only my good works. Alexander, this is the whole meaning. The Wisdom of the Talmud On charity. Better give no charity than to give in such a way as to put a poor man to shame. On poverty. When food is lacking in the larder, quarrel knocks on the door. On adjusting a quarrel. A reconciliation without an admission of error on both sides is not a true reconciliation. On evil disposition. Bad neighbors count a man's income, not his expenses. What is legend? A great Talmudist declared, Legend is only irresponsible history and therefore not necessarily untrue. Thus, from the wisdom of the Talmud, the legend of Rabbi Samuel. It is written, that Rabbi Samuel came to the city of Rome. And there he chanced to find a bracelet which had been lost by the queen. And the queen sent a crier throughout the city. Whoever returns the queen's bracelet within 30 days shall be rewarded with many bags of gold. But if the bracelet is not returned within 30 days, let him who has found it beware. His head will be cut off. Come with me, Rabbi Samuel. I will show you the way to the palace. Thank you, my son. But if the returns the bracelet... I am not going to the palace. But Rabbi Samuel, the reward will be great. I am not going to the palace. Rabbi Samuel, do you hear? Please come with me and be rich. My son, I am going home. I shall not go to the palace. Rabbi Samuel, for the last time you will lose the reward. I am not going to the palace. Only ten days are left. 
Why endanger your life? I am not going to the palace. It is the 30th day, Rabbi Sam. Please lose no time. I am not going to the palace. The 31st day, Rabbi, be quick. A ship is ready to take you to safety. No, my son. Today, I go to the palace. Unbind his arms and let him stand free. You may approach, Rabbi. Why didn't you return this bracelet? I have returned it, Your Majesty. Why didn't you bring it yesterday or the day before and claim the reward? Why did you endanger your life? Your Majesty, to fear a human being is akin to idolatry. When the act of fearing, man begins to worship what he fears. And I may worship only God. Very nice. But why didn't you return my bracelet sooner? In order, Your Highness, that you should not say I feared you or hope for reward. For I fear only the Lord, and he is my reward. Go in peace, Rabbi Samuel. You are blessed in your God, and he is blessed in you. Above all things, study. So taught the rabbis. Whether for the sake of learning or for material reasons, study. For whatever the motives that impel you at first, you will very soon love study for its own sake. A scholar's hymn. <laughs> of the Talmud on sinfulness. Commit a sin twice and you will think it is perfectly allowable. On honest dealing. Be rather a tail to lions than a head to foxes. On gluttony. More people die from overeating than from undernourishment. On propaganda analysis. That which a child speaks, he has heard from his father or mother. parable of righteousness. It happened, they say, that a warrior king came into a peaceful city, and there he found a judge. And before this judge were brought two men who were engaged in dispute. And the warrior king, it is written, sat beside the judge and listened to the testimony. Sire, are you comfortable? Yes, judge. Uh, proceed with your case. Let the two men who are in dispute come before us. We, we are, are here. here. State the nature of this dispute. I bought a house from this man. That he did. 
After I bought the house, it was necessary for me to make a few repairs. That he did. And while I was repairing a wall, I found a great quantity of emerald and jasper and precious sapphire. That he did. Then I offered it back to him. That he did. And he wouldn't take it. Is that the dispute? It, it is. is. Why didn't you keep what you found? Well, I bought only the house. Therefore, how can the treasure be mine? I sold you the house. The treasure belongs to you. It doesn't. May you never suffer epilepsy. It does. May the ten plagues never be visited on your family, but it belongs to you. No. I say yes. I say no. Shh. Be still, both of you. Hear me. You. Do you have a son? I do. And you? Do you have a daughter? I do. Then hear my decision. You marry your daughter to his son. Let the treasure be a dowry for them. We are happy to have a visitor to this court. Sire, we should be pleased if you would render an opinion on our judgment. Why do you smile, sire? Are such matters settled differently in your country? Very differently, my dear judge. We should be pleased to learn. Very simple. If this dispute should be brought before me, why, I would imprison this man, imprison that fine fellow, and, uh... Keep the jewels myself. I see that I have misjudged you and your country. Tell me, sire, does the sun shine in your land? Naturally. And does the rain cause the fruits and the grain to ripen? Yes, of course. Tell me also, sire, are there sheep and cows in your land? Yes. Oh, I understand now. Surely the sun and the rain come to your land for the sake of the innocent beast, not for the sake of unjust men. The Talmud is more than an encyclopedia of law and legend. It is also literature, and literature is written life. And so the sayings and the homilies penetrated the daily life of the Jew until they were as familiar as the accent of speech and as beloved as familiar melody. The Jewish mother in the ghetto cities of Poland did not sing of warriors or feats of strength. The cradle lullaby was, My child, I will give you raisins and almonds and a small white goat to play with. And when you grow up, study and be good. And perhaps you may even become a rapper. Talmudic legend. A blind man and a man without legs were brought before the court of rabbis. Strange to say, these two men had been apprehended in theft, and the man without legs denied his guilt. You can't punish me. I didn't do the stealing. I can't walk. And yet you were apprehended in the theft. But look at me. I can't walk. Blind man, did you steal the goods in question? Rabbi, I cannot see Bailiff, you will hold these men in another room until we have discussed this case. Take them, Bailiff. (laughs) 
This is a difficult case. Mm, it is, Rabbi. Speaking candidly, how could a blind man steal what he can't see? Also, how can a man without legs take what he cannot reach? It's quite clear from the evidence. The man without legs saw the object of the felony. He climbed on the back of the blind man, and together they stole it. Even worse, who was the thief? I think I know. Ask the bailiff to return with the prisoner. The prisoners are ready, Rabbi. Thank you, bailiff. <clears throat> One theft was committed. You committed the theft, blind man. But I cannot see to commit a theft. And you, man without legs, you also committed the theft. But you said it was a single theft. Then how can both of us be guilty? Bailiff, raise the man without legs. Good. Now, Bailiff, place him on the blind man's back. Good. Hear me. For the purposes of crime, you were one, even as body and soul is one. Therefore, for the purposes of punishment, let you also be one. I may only punish the body. For your souls, you will answer in heaven. But... Hear me further. The Lord has already punished your bodies with blindness and loss of limb. Therefore, it is not fitting that we should add further to your punishment. You may leave this court. Rabbi. Yes, blind man? Because you have been merciful to me, who is seen but cannot see, may he who sees but is not seen be merciful to you. Heaven and earth I call to be witnesses. Be it pagan or believer, man or woman, manservant or woman servant, according to the actions of every human being does the Holy Spirit rest upon him. The wisdom of the Talmud. We have taken only a leaf from the Talmud and have read it as if by the thin candle taken from a great torch. Out of a collective human experience of 800 years, there was set down in the early centuries of the modern calendar the body of oral tradition which men called the Talmud. Academies were destroyed, teachers were martyred, study was prohibited. Yet, with his last breath, a dying master appointed his disciple, and the law and the learning flowed on in the face of a thousand deaths. The verb was lamed, to teach, and the noun was Talmud, teaching. And in what emerged, amid the rivers of text and the oceans of commentary, men were able to behold the afterglow of the Bible. Copies of the script you have just heard, as well as the talk which follows, may be obtained without cost by writing to The Eternal Light, 3080 Broadway, New York 27, New York. And now we present Dr. Joachim Prince, Rabbi of the Temple B'nai Abraham of Newark, New Jersey. Dr. Prince. You have just listened to a broadcast which aimed to make an ancient book, the Talmud, which in fact is a library, live again. Admittedly, it dealt only with a few of the thousands of different phases of the gigantic work. Listening to this interpretation, we realize again how great the difficulties are to translate the values of ancient times into the language and the terms of the world of today. Yet the Talmud is not a dead book. For 1,500 years, our people, young and old, made this book the source of their strength. In discussing the ancient laws, even those which were no longer applicable to their daily experience, 
they forgot the degradations and indignities to which they were subjected. And the glory of the past that they lived because their present life was too humiliating to be accepted, the small towns and villages of Eastern Europe, the teaching and learning of the Talmud, transformed their dingy little places of Jewish studies into halls of wisdom and faith. Alas, of the people who understood the Talmud, only very few survived. Thousands of teachers and pupils have perished in Europe. Yet the passion and the glow which live in the legal and the poetic, the rational and the mystic, the arguments and the dreams of the thousands of pages which are called the Talmud are part not only of the tradition of the Jew, but of the civilization of the world. Of the multi-voiced chorus of this civilization, Judaism is but one. At many times, each of the many voices is called upon to sing the part of a soloist. The Jewish people in the days of the Bible and Talmud have sung their part. To make it heard for generations to come is a great and sacred task but to make it part of the whole of the human symphony is a task no less important. In the harmony of all the voices and in the attempt to make each of them sound clearly so that it may be heard and understood lies the guarantee for a better world and a greater, more meaningful civilization. Thank you, Dr. Prince. The Eternal Light is written by Morton Wishengrad. The music was composed and conducted by Morris Mamorsky. Kenner Robert H. Siegel was the soloist, and Alexander Scorby the narrator. The entire production was under the direction of Frank Pat. This program has come to you as a public service of the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations under the auspices of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. For a free copy of today's script, write to The Eternal Light, 3080 Broadway, New York 27, New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Psalm 63, David said, My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips, when I remember thee upon my bed, and meditate on thee in the night watches. To help you focus your thoughts upon God at the close of this day, we bring you this devotional meditation from Morning and Evening by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great English preacher of the 19th century. Our text for this evening is found in John chapter 5 and verse 39. They are they which testify of me. Jesus Christ is the Alpha and Omega of the Bible. He is the constant theme of its sacred pages. From first to last they testify of Him. At the creation we at once discern Him as one of the sacred trinity. We catch a glimpse of Him in the promise of the woman's seed. We see him typified in the ark of Noah. We walk with Abraham as he sees Messiah's day. We dwell in the tents of Isaac and Jacob, feeding upon the gracious promise. We hear the venerable Israel talking of Shiloh, 
and in the numerous types of the law, we find the Redeemer abundantly foreshadowed. Prophets and kings, priests and preachers, all look one way. They all stand as the cherubs did over the ark, desiring to look within and to read the mystery of God's great propitiation. Still more manifestly in the New Testament we find our Lord the one pervading subject. It is not an ingot here or there, or dust of gold thinly scattered, but here you stand upon a solid floor of gold. For the whole substance of the New Testament is Jesus crucified, and even its closing sentence is bejeweled with the Redeemer's name. We should always read Scripture in this light. We should consider the Word to be as a mirror into which Christ looks down from heaven, and then we, looking into it, see His face reflected as in a glass. Darkly, it is true, but still in such a way as to be a blessed preparation for seeing Him as we shall see Him face to face. This volume contains Jesus Christ's letters to us, perfumed by His love. These pages are the garments of our King, and they all smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia. Scripture is the royal chariot in which Jesus rides, and it is paved with love for the daughters of Jerusalem. The Scriptures are the swaddling bands of the Holy Child Jesus. Unroll them, and you find your Savior. The quintessence of the Word of God is Christ. This meditation was taken from Morning and Evening by C. H. Spurgeon. Please listen each evening at this same time for Morning and Evening. <laughs>